Good evening. Calling to order the, uh, the meeting for the Arlington Select Board for Monday, February 8th, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Select Board Bird Chair. Oh, try that again. Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are pre present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes, thank you. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Douglas Heim? Yes. And Ashley Marr, board administrators participating remotely. As an initial matter, just to discuss um, briefly, select board member uh, Curro is not gonna be joining us at the meeting tonight. He did deliver a letter of resignation from his seat on the board, which will be effective on this Friday. So he will not be with, with us tonight and he will not be with us in any further meeting. So certainly a loss to the board, board. will miss Mr. Carl's insight. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are encouraged in, are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as pu reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak in order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes. It is helpful for participants to see your first full, your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the meeting materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to our first item on our agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care not to identify yourself. This meeting will fe feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by a roll call vote. All right, so we're gonna take a couple of items out of order here. We do have item number two on our agenda is a COVID-19 update with the town manager and Christian Bongiorno, our director of health and human services, but we're gonna wait till she's available, Mr. Chaplin. 
So she will actually be with us in about five minutes. So if we could take item three and then take item two, that would work well if, yep. if the chair is okay with that. So item number three on our agenda is a facilities department update and introduction to the new facilities director, Mr. Chapdillion. All right, thank you, Mr. Hurd. I'm just promoting Mr. Feeney and Mr. Walters. So what we wanted to do tonight uh, was twofold. First, we wanted to provide the board uh, with an update from Mr. Feeney on his work in the facilities department um, over the last year plus, and then give a chance for the board to virtually meet our new permanent facilities director, Greg Walters. Uh, as you know, uh, after our prior facilities director left for another opportunity, uh, Jim Feeney, the assistant town manager at the time, uh, stepped over to the facilities department to act in an interim capacity uh, that la lasted a little longer than I think we initially uh, expected, um, given a number of circumstances, uh, not the least of which was the onset of the pandemic. Uh, but we feel very lucky to have been able to recruit uh, and now have working for the town, Greg Walters. So uh, again, what I want to do is ask Jim to talk a little bit about uh, his observations of where the current status of the facilities department, and then give a chance for you to meet Mr. Walter. So uh, with the board's discretion, I'd ask Jim to say a few words. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, members of the board. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak about the facilities department tonight. Uh, I can honestly say it was wonderful to be a part of the department during such uncertain times. In many ways, the circumstances brought upon by COVID shine a light on the importance of the work done by the facilities department, uh, including things like increased disinfection, repairing and overhauling ventilation equipment, upgrading HVAC filters, procuring and distributing air cleaners and plastic barriers, among other things. The facilities department had and continues to have a critical role in keeping our building occupants safe and at ease. You know, historically, this work took place in the background, but you know the women and men of the facilities department were up for the challenge as their work was catapulted to the forefront of everyone's mind. So, you know, I just wanna take the, you know, take this moment to applaud and thank the folks in the facilities department for working tirelessly to get the schools ready for reoccupancy and for keeping them operating and also for providing assistance to various other departments throughout the various stages of the pandemic, you know, including working alongside DPW to provide safe elections, uh, staging an unprecedented outdoor town meeting to now you know, coming around and supporting COVID testing sites and vaccination uh, delivery at Arlington High School. So, um, with that, you know, I'd also like to say a few words that our this just past construction season was uh, rather busy with various capital projects of all sizes, not the least of which were, you know, facilities department closely supporting construction projects at three occupied buildings, all with very time sensitive milestones, uh, including reoccupying the Parmenter School via the Monotony Preschool. Shifting and moving many functions at AHS is a part of the early enabling phases of the rebuild project and uh, moving and setting health and human services up in a new office suite, a newly, newly renovated office suite at the central school. Uh, very briefly, looking ahead, I'm pleased to report we have recently filled many key vacancies in the maintenance division and for the first time in a very, very long time, have a full complement of custodial staff. So uh, with that, we have relaunched a work order system in the district and are considering ways to further expand its use as well as uh, different options for expanding use with a focus towards asset management. I uh, feel that, that you know, capturing asset specific data should help aid us with our capital needs forecasting and planning for various uh, aging building systems. So, you know, with our new director, Greg Walters, Greg Walters, who you're about to meet, we'll continue to assess the resources currently in place in the department and plan for what resources may be necessary in the future to manage a, you know, it's a combined portfolio of 
nearly 40 buildings with a replacement value of just shy of $400 million. So it, it is a big job and there is a range of assets from you know, aging historical buildings to increasingly complex modern buildings, both of which present you know, exciting but labor intensive challenges. So with that, uh, obviously we'd like to turn it over to Greg if uh, I could. All right, Greg. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on board here in Arlington. Uh, just a little bit, I came over from uh, UMass Dartmouth where I was Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities Management and Capital Planning. Um, so I'm familiar with, with this type of work uh, that Jim's referencing. Um, he and I had a good uh, month of January turning over the department. Um, you know, this is now my second week with uh, uh, kind of on my own and, uh, and we're getting into it, you know, take away the snow that's happened over the weekend and, and coming up and uh, that's always out there, but um, we got a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, students returning to the high school in two weeks, um, you know, so another milestone that, that we'll accomplish and, and really looking forward to, to working in the town of Arlington. Also happy that I'm a resident of the town. Um, and so, you know, it's another vested interest to make sure we're doing everything the best we can. Thank you. And we'll turn to the board for any questions. Uh, Ms. Diggins. Um, you know, welcome aboard. I mean, uh, very impressive. I mean, of course, the thing that sticks out is the nuclear submarine uh, <laughs> party resume. And uh, 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 I'm sure in some way that'll come in handy. And, uh, but, but also, <laughs> I mean, um, kind of listening to um, what Mr. Feeney said, I mean, I, I am excited to hear about the asset management um, plan initiative because uh, I know the MBTA you know, is, is, is taking that on. And, and it sounds so simple, but it's really hard. And, 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 but when when you have it, and when you know what you have, and you have a sense of, of how and, um, it's performing and and be able to predict when things are going to break down, it, it's just so valuable. So I really am happy to hear about that. And and um, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to say to Mr. Feeney, um, I cannot tell you how many accolades uh, in your interim facilities director a role that I've received from the employees that um, when you stepped into that role, so much so that they literally begged me, my brother's a custodian at the Audison Middle School, um, to keep you there. Um, and I said, just as much as you want um, Mr. Feeney, Jim, to stay there, that's how much we need him back on um, the town side as the uh, assistant town manager with our deputy town manager, town manager. So um, once again, you've, um, anything you've taken on outside the umbrella of what your original job description is, you definitely excel at. And I just wanna say, I appreciate that. Um, I know I was along with many others longing for your tenure to be shorter, um, but I understood the process, COVID-19 hit, that kind of put the brakes to everything. So um, I, just, I just wanted you to know, um, which you probably know already because you have interactions um, with these employees that um, they wanted you there permanently in, in the worst way. Um, but having said that, <clears throat> going through the process and um, what we did with Mr. Walters, and I know he's only been on, I think it's your second or third week? Um, sixth, sixth week. Sixth <laughs> week, okay. Um, I'm getting really positive reports back for someone that, you know, doesn't seem to be much of a learning curve. Um, some of it may be because you lived in Arlington. Um, some may not. Uh, so what I'd like to say to Mr. Walters, Greg, um, in terms of uh, facilities director oversight and moving forward with where we're upgrading our schools, our fire, fire station, town departments, DPW, that's a whole another host of issues. Uh, one of the things for me in the past that I've been really frustrated with was, um, and, and this may be um, rectified with the asset management um, that you and my colleagues spoke to earlier, uh, is that one of my previous jobs was working for the phone company and I was in charge of not only all the linesmen, 
but the equipment they worked on. And back then there were no software programs like they are now, as well as companies that could um, tailor it for you. So I, I basically made between Lotus 1, 2, 3 and DBase. I don't know if any of you have heard that. I'm really old. I've heard Set it. up my own, <laughs> you have, um, you know, for trunks, senders, mockers. And one thing that I feel like we really should be working on more that I've seen has happened in the past, not under Mr. Feeney, but previous to him, is that with a lot of our equipment um, in terms of maintenance, warranties, and recalls, because the big thing is, you know, like, like recalls would come in and they wouldn't be followed up on. And that simple part that they were saying, you know, you know, foil 257 is faulty, you need to replace it. And that wasn't followed up on. So then when it finally caused a major issue to that piece of equipment, they'd say, well, you didn't take the opportunity to follow up when we issued the recall and you waited so long that part's not even available anymore. And it turns into a five or tenfold cost ticket item to repair and or replace. So my big thing, and I know Jim could probably bring you up to speed on that, is especially with all the you know new construction that we have on with HVAC and you know I know all about chalk lines and how well that's not really HVAC but um, having worked for construction companies is um, if the asset man uh, management program that you have in place you feel encompasses all that but um, for, for maintenance you know getting that new piece of equipment logging it in somewhere in a software program uh, data purchase yearly or biannual times that it needs to be inspected and upgraded recalls when they're issued that that stuff really stays on top of because you know th then you're you're paying you know dimes and nickels versus hundreds of dollars to thousands so um and i think we can save a lo lot of money on that and i, I want to demonstrate to our town residents that we are doing things like that because that's one of the biggest things they say is you don't maintain this stuff and that's why it kind of gets out of control um, I mean, the perfect thing is the town hall door. It's, it's we haven't been able to fix it forever. We're doing it now because we're um, we have construction going down there. But that's plagued us for like five, ten years. And you know, if you're a disabled person or a senior, you know, you had to be Hercules um, to get that uh, door open. So I don't know if I know I kind of went on and on with that. But if you have any thoughts around um, managing uh, the equipment, whether it's equipment, whether it's switching to clean energy things, um, and maybe if you could give me like a four to six or whatever amount of sentence answer on that. Sure. Um, asset management is critical, as Mr. Diggins pointed out. I mean, it's, we first need to know what we have in order to be able to properly maintain it. Um, and so, you know, Jim started the legwork on this and I'm going to continue it with the goal being getting our asset management system up and running. So when the new high school comes online, as these new systems are transferred over to our ownership. We're rolling those into the asset management. They'll come over with, you know, how do you properly maintain them? How do you, uh, the schedule for preventive maintenance, the replacement parts, the warranties, um, the vendors who are gonna, you know, help us troubleshoot it if, sh if should there be an issue. Um, all those things kind of get into the system. And so it's a one-stop shop to be able to do that. Uh, these as asset management systems allow for us to, um, say, well, we want to do the, the monthly maintenance on this and so we can click a button and here's all the parts you need in order to be able to do that maintenance. So it helps streamline it for us. And then the staff have an easier time to do that maintenance. So they don't have as many hurdles in front of them when they do it. Um, so I think that's a, a big part of it is making sure we fully understand that asset management is everything, right? It's doorknobs to vehicles, to HVAC equipment, to flooring, you know, it's, it's kind of everything and you, and you really take a, a look at that and get it in there. When you have that in place, it also allows you to, to develop a, a one year, five year, 20 year plan of replacement. You know, we know the life cycles for equipment and we can say that in 10 years, we're gonna have to spend X amount of money to replace these pieces of equipment um, that are coming up at the end of their life. Uh, so it will do many things for us um, as we get that system online. Uh, as far as sustainability goes, um, uh, I've already met Ken Pruitt. Uh, we're, you know, going through some things. We've had some initial discussions. Uh, we've set up uh, tri-weekly meetings, of which I'll have my first with him tomorrow afternoon. Um, and so we'll start working through that process because there's a lot of um, 
exciting initiatives out there and a lot of things we want to take advantage of. Um, I know there's been a lot of work done to, to move towards electrification. Uh, I've already had a conversation with Ken about um, something I did at Dartmouth, which was an energy master plan. And so what that laid out was when we go to replace a chiller or a piece of equipment, how do we replace it in such a way that we're meeting our energy goals for the future, that we're not going to replace it with something that in five years we're going, nah, that, that is a lot of emissions. We should have replaced it with this, um, you know, and so kind of looking at an overall plan to make sure we're, you know, moving toward that general direction. Okay, thank you. And if I could just ask one um, follow-up question, um, only because when this was first proposed many years ago, the answer that was given to me when I, I'm still a member of the board was uh, uh, the town was employing town and school side, something like school dog or school doc or something like that. And I looked at the software and it, it really was whatever you put in, it stored it. So my question to you is um, with the asset management um, program, software, whatever that you have, is it um, like auto-populated or auto-generated or is it user-driven? Meaning that, I, you know, I understand the first step we took in Google or school doc or whatever, which was just entering whatever, but then it just sat there. It didn't right. sort of have like a tickler system that every month, it like, like how does that work? Sure, it, it's School Dude um, is the name of the program. Uh, I used it uh, for about five years at a previous um, position I held. So I'm very familiar with their system and how they operate. Uh, initially, you have to get the data in there. So there's a little bit of legwork that has to happen. Either our staff goes around and does all the information or we, we are looking at options to hire them to come out and you know walk through all the buildings, take all the pictures, look up the information and populate that. Once that's in there, then you do have to maintain it. It will do things on its own. It will generate work orders, generate um, preventive maintenance schedules and do those things. But when you change the piece of equipment out, you have to update it. When you complete the maintenance, you gotta tell the system that you completed the maintenance. So there is some user input that's gonna be required. Um, and that is within the capability of an administrative assistant to handle. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a, a trades person um, to do that. You just have to be, let's say, computer savvy, you know, familiar with data entry, how databases work, you know, and, and those type of things. So it, it is something that uh, where I was previously, I had an admin assistant that maintained the system and it worked pretty well. Okay. And I promise this will be my last question. Just like this is my stomping ground, you know, with then it was NT. &T. Can you also use uh, School Dude? I wish I had a different name. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to give you an example. When I was in the phone company, we had trunks, senders, markers, lines, things like that. Um, I had a system set up that um, also had employee inf uh, information within the system so that if a trunk or, or a marker needed just regular maintenance, I could click and it would tell me by designation numbers what employees, which was just about everybody that could do that. But if it was a complicated fix that you needed to work with the company, that um, you know, it's someone who's a new hire that hasn't had the training and experience to do that. So if I knew I had a you know severe issue on marker four two seven, I had a, a place where you could click and you could see there were probably four of your sixty two employees that could could fix that. Is that something that can be done in school, dude, or is that a little too ambitious? Uh, it, the capability is there. So when you when a work order comes in, you can assign it. Uh, there's different ways you can assign it based on uh, the skill level of the person which you can enter in. Is it a carpenter? Is it a carpenter helper? Is it an electrician? Is it a senior electrician? You know, who right. whose capability could do that? Um, uh, let's say plumbing might be one, right? Where you have a bunch, of, you have a few plumbers on staff and somebody's really good at doing physical plumbing, somebody else is really good at doing like heating plumbing, you know, is more familiar with that. So you can assign it when it comes in. It is a user interface. So when that work order comes in, the person who's re reviewing those work orders will need to be able to know, you know, what that work entails and who it fits best. And that's where that part would go to like the building maintenance supervisor. Uh, that position would be able to take those work orders in and then assign them to the correct person. Uh, the nice thing there is 
you know, with mobile apps now and everything. So they'll have them on their phone and we can actually schedule out somebody's day. The first two hours, you're going to go up to the Dolan school and you're going to work on this next two hours. You can go over to Thompson and you're going to work on these things. Um, and so you kind of fill out the person's day and you help optimize, you know, their efficiency throughout that day as well. Um, so you can schedule a bunch, you know, all the work at Dolan for one day. So they're not, you know, spending two hours driving around the different schools throughout the day and the like. Uh, so the capabilities there, I think for our staff, since we have one plumber, you know, uh, two HVAC technicians, it's not as uh, critical. So for us, it will either be, can we do the work in house or can, do we have to call a vendor in uh, to help us? Okay, thank you. And I will, in two or three weeks after I talk to the town manager in some form, uh, socially distancing, uh, contact you with uh, some more thoughts that I don't need to share at this board meeting. I want to thank the chair for indulging me and welcome aboard. Please don't take thank any you. of my questions as well, no. anything, you know, negative or criticism. I'm really excited that you're here and you're going to carry on with what Mr. Feeney has uh, instituted. And I feel a nine out of 10 comfortable that, um, and you can get to 10 out of 10, <laughs> uh, nine out of 10 uh, in terms of your competence and, and expertise and experience. And um, this is a big thing and I appreciate you coming, staying in Arlington and now working in Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and first of all, uh, welcome Mr. Walters. Um, you really, uh, we're lucky to have you in Arlington. You're a very impressive resume and experience and, and thank you for your service in the Navy. Um, Mr. Diggins already referenced that. The other thing I saw in your experience that could come in handy was your uh, training as a court mediator because with <laughs> competing interests um, that that may come in handy and with the various uh, needs of, of, of uh, the different buildings. So I, I really look forward to um, getting to know you as, as, as you um, progress in the, in the job. And it's a really exciting time with the amount of construction going on in the community and the challenges that you're going to face. So w welcome to Arlington and uh, in, in your position and, and thank you. And if I could, Mr. Chair, I also want to congratulate Mr. Feeney um, for his uh, promotion to Deputy Town Manager of Operations and, and thank him for the work, as Mrs. Mahan said, uh, that he had done um, over the past uh, year, year and a half. I, I don't know how long it is, Jim. It's, it, I know it's been a long, it was a long time, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I don't mute myself. Thank you to Mr. Walters, welcome. Um, I also, I do wanna thank Jim for the work that he's done. Um, you know, I know all across town, he's been doing a lot of work, but as a parent of young kids who we like to stay, we want to stay in school, just the, the job that both the school department has done and the, in conjunction with the facilities department to keep the kids safe in school has really been amazing. And the results have been mind blowing, I think to a lot of people. Um, from where we thought we'd be at the beginning of the process. So I do want to particularly thank you for that. Um, and Mr. Waltz, again, thank you for your willingness to, to come and lend your expertise to the town of Arlington. I don't know if you know this, but the word around town hall is they refer to Jim as the legend. So you have some big <laughs> shoes to fill, but I think you can, I think you are up to the task. There's a lot of work that has to be done. That's certainly clear with you know you knew what you were stepping into but i think you're with uh with the help of our town staff and your experience we're in good hands here Thank so you. i appreciate that all righty with that i don't believe we have any motions so thank you thank you for joining us tonight thanks jim thank you thank you guys thank you all right so now we will skip back to item number two on our agenda, COVID-19 update with Mr. Chaplin, our town manager, and Ms. Bongiorno, our director of health and human services. All right, Christine, here she is. So I, I will once again, uh, very briefly, just introduce this agenda item and let Christine speak to the board. But we thought this meeting would be a good opportunity uh, to come and present to the board as we're in this place now where it's still very important to maintain uh, restrictions or certain restrictions that have been in place for a long time now to keep people from transmitting the virus. But yet we're also transitioning into a time where we're trying to roll out more and more vaccinations to protect people from the virus. So we're in a 
sort of both a continuing and transitional period. And we thought this would be a good time to provide the board an update on both of those efforts. What, I, what I'll also add is uh, for those watching uh, as a team, uh, myself and Christine and a number of other town staff meet uh, daily still, um, well, actually Monday through Thursday to check in on the status of our response to the pandemic. Uh, we provide weekly emails uh, via the town notice system to communicate with the public uh, on Thursday of each week, coupled with an interview with ACMI that is uh, packaged into that weekly notice, uh, either with myself or with Ms. Bongiorno. Um, and now as we're again getting deeper and deeper into the vaccination period, we'll be talking about whether or not we want to increase the frequency of our communication. Uh, as as it was uh, earlier in the pandemic, but we want to we want to make sure that uh, at the end of the day that when we're communicating, it's being heard, and sometimes being more frequent helps you be heard, and sometimes being less frequent helps you be heard, depending on uh, what you're dealing with. So we we try to continually triangulate around that um, you know around that issue. But with that said, I uh, Christine, I know she's she's shared with a couple groups today uh, an update. So hopefully uh, she's she's feels well prepared and well practiced. Um, so I'll I'll turn it to Christine and but quickly before doing that, just want to compliment Christine on really for almost a year now, just an exceptionally job well done. And it's it's tiring, it's frankly exhausting, and there's still a long runway ahead of us. But Christine uh, continues to be really a tremendous leader for this town. Uh, on this on this front and on many fronts, so we're we're very fortunate to have her, and I'm glad she's joining us here tonight. Great, thank you, Adam. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you to the board um, for this opportunity. I know it's been a while since I've uh, seen you in person, and um, you know I'm, I was thankful for the opportunity tonight. Um, so I do want to just give you a, a quick run from the beginning of COVID back um, about a year ago. So you know it was right around February last year when we began. Um, quarantining cases coming back from, that had traveled to high-risk areas um, around the world. And um, it was really just the beginning stages of hearing what COVID-19 was and what was happening around the world. And you know, our, our public health nurse was doing the quarantines as, as, as she does for any communicable disease. And really it was the beginning. Um, it really wasn't until March when we um, had our first case here in Arlington. And one of the first cases actually in the state, um, it, you know, it was a, a younger case. Um, that really sparked a lot of media attention. Um, it, it was at that point um, when the state and, and our community began um, this journey and this, um, you know, this, these efforts that um, we've been working through for the almost past year. Um, our office consists of about uh, 10 staff. Um, we also, in Health and Human Services, we have the Council on Aging, Veteran Services, and the Arlington Youth Counseling Center as well. So staff from all of our divisions have been participating in these, these efforts. Um, mostly the health department staff have been working around the clock doing contact tracing, um, which includes, um, you know, when we receive a report of a positive case, we reach out to that positive case, determine who their contacts are, and we trace back to make sure we prevent additional cases from happening. So if it's a, if it's a young person in the school system, we try to figure out if they're involved in sports or, you know, where, the, where they may have traveled, trying to make sure we're, we're kind of tamping down any additional cases that may pop up. Um, so the health department staff have been leading that effort. Additionally, the team has been doing, um, has been enforcing all of the governor's orders. So er early on, there were governor's orders coming out weekly, daily, um, where we would, uh, you know, receive information about potential outbreak, potential cluster areas. So whether it's, um, you know, restaurants or whatever the, whatever the area was that we were seeing cases, the governor would come up with an order. Our office would be in, would be responsible for enforcing that. Uh, we continue to do that today. Um, we continue to do that now. Um, so both of those efforts continue um, uh, currently. In addition to that, we're now faced with um, the opportunity. I would say it's more of an opportunity, but the opportunity to begin vaccinating our communities, our, our populations. Um, and so we've been working closely um, with our uh, Department of Public Health to access vaccine, uh, to roll out vaccines to the, to the groups within our community that are currently eligible. Um, so you may have seen um, the state has put out a three phase plan to roll out vaccine to the populations. The first phase included um, you know, the, the individuals that could potentially be 
um, getting COVID and spreading it to others, to higher risk people. So, you know, doctors and phys um, doctors, nurses, home health care. Um, it also included nursing homes, which is an, a really big step for us. We saw a lot of cases, particularly in the spring, uh, in our nursing homes. Um, so we were really excited to see that. Um, but, but phase one really covered a lot of those populations. Um, Arlington began receiving vaccine to distribute within our community around the first responder uh, category within phase one. So we rolled out um, 600 vaccinations to first responders in our neighboring communities and here in Arlington. So we partnered with Lexington, Belmont, and Watertown to, to, to roll out vaccine to first responders. We also included other healthcare workers, um, such as nurses that may have been missed um, in previous categories within phase, phase one. Um, we then shifted gears and began vaccinating the other um, groups within phase one um, as vaccine became available. So the, um, the, the, pro the program started for us in the second week of January. We're now in the second week of February. So we're now starting our second doses. Um, so each COVID vaccine require, you know, both Pfizer and Moderna um, require two doses. So we're starting our second doses this week for the first responders. Um, and that will be wrapped up by the end of this week. Um, so we then began shifting after the first responders over to the um, additional healthcare workers, home health aides, where we saw a lot of cases. Um, a lot of our older people that have home health aides coming into their homes um, were, were getting COVID from, from those individuals. So we were really happy to be able to provide vaccine to those, um, that category. And then we, um, once the 75 and over population, um, which is the first category in phase, two opened up, we received some a small number of doses of vaccine and we began holding our 75 and over clinic last Wednesday. Um, we are doing clinics um, on Wednesdays. Um, we are lucky enough to have, um, you know, our schools are remote at the current time and we have a site that we use. It's a school site. We have our school nurses on board to help, um, which has been, been amazing. Um, and so we, you know, at, at this point, our um, vaccinations, although very limited at the moment, we are hoping to ramp up uh, and to be able to provide more as, as more opens up from the federal government. Um, here in Arlington, we've been very fortunate. Um, we have long practiced dispensing uh, vaccines to our community. Um, if any of you were around in, um, during H1N1, you may remember we held major mass vaccinations, um, you know, clinics uh, at the Arlington High School. I think we were the highest, one of the highest um, vaccination sites in local public health across the state, um, which we are very proud of. Uh, we learned a lot from those, those efforts. COVID, vac vaccinating in COVID is a very different um, environment. So we obviously had to, to shift and, and change, our, change our efforts to address the fact that we have to be socially distanced, everyone has to wear masks, we have to have appointments, things shifted slightly. So, um, you know, it's been a challenge that <clears throat> we, know, um, we, we know how to, to address. And, um, you know, I think, although we have a small number of doses currently, we've been able to perfect um, each at each clinic, we look at what worked, what didn't work, and we're addressing those areas of concern, and we fix it for the next clinic to make it make it even better for the next uh, and safer. So, you know, I think we're we have a, an amazing team within Health and Human Services, um, but we also have an amazing town staff as well. So we've been able to pull staff from all of the, the various departments, from the schools to the facilities department, uh, DPW, IT. I mean, I could go on and on. I, I literally. Um, I'm amazed every day at the team we have here in Arlington because when I talk to colleagues in other communities, we just don't, they just don't have that. Um, so I do have to say, I'm, I'm, I feel like we are so lucky. We have a great staff and we just have an amazing um, team. Um, so I wanna just make sure I, I do that little shout out because it's, it's, it wouldn't have happened without all of the, the hands on deck. So we've currently vaccinated 1200 residents. Um, and our goal is to get up to about a thousand per week once once the vaccine becomes available. Um, so I think that's really all I have. I know Adam, you had mentioned we we meet daily. I don't know if I've forgotten anything that you want to add. I, I would only add that um, you know collectively between Christine, myself, and other municipalities, we continue to advocate at the state level for expanding. The role of municipalities in vaccinating its residents, uh, as Christine mentioned, the hundred a week. We we have a goal to get that up to a thousand, hopefully soon. 
uh, and, and we think we've started to make um, some strides in having the state view municipalities or at least those municipalities that have vaccination capacity um, at, you know, at, at playing a larger role. So every week that goes by as hopefully supply loosens up and more is being sent by the federal government, we'll get a better and better idea of what might be available and what role municipalities might be able to play. But I think the message that we want to send that I know Christine is sending is that uh, we are ready uh, as the vaccines arrive. We're ready. Uh, Christine and her team have a plan and we stand, we, we stand ready to, to begin vaccinating as many people as we can based on supply. Thank you. All right, I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, Ms. Bongiorno, I want to thank you for all the work that, that you and your team have done since the onset of the pandemic. And whether it's from members, people in the healthcare community, members of our state delegation, people work for the state, the work that you're doing comes up over and over again and, and uh, how, how hard you've been working and, and how great a job you've been doing with your team. So, so thank you so much for that. And you know, we still have a ways to go. And, and um, but I, I know, and, and people in town appreciate the updates, appreciate what's on the website and, and the references um, to different locations, even outside of Arlington. Um, and I, I, I just want to touch on that for a second. I, I did see your update last week. And uh, one of the frustrations you expressed, and I think we all feel is Right now, we're trying to get as many people 75 and over vaccinated, and, and um, it seems like there should be more of an emphasis to make those vaccinations available at the local level as, a, as opposed to pushing the, 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 that age group to the mass vaccination sites. And I'm just wondering, um, it sounds like there might be a little bit of hope in the, in the interim to, to increase what we have, but I'm just wondering what you might recommend to people um, who can't get in at the local level, you know, where they can go and, and where they can look and maybe where they can ask for help if they don't have access to, to, to the computer and to, to be able to um, sign up for a vaccination. Thank you. Um, so um, it's, been, <laughs> it's been very challenging for our over 75 population. Um, this was uh, the, the rollout plan um, was probably one, you know, a lot of the most difficult phone calls we had ever received in our office in my 20 years of working for the town of Arlington because it is so um, frustrating and hard for people to navigate the system, whether they have access to a, web, to a computer or not, um, it was re really hard. So um, our Council on Aging has really been working around the clock to reach out to um, you know, the populations that, that they work with. So we have a, a, a large number of um, residents that um, that receive social work services. Um, we have a lot of service providers we work with. Um, so they've, they've reached out to all of those populations. We've been able to, to get people in for vaccination appointments through our, our office, um, through our clinic. And I will say we also had a, a, we had a, we have a list on the website where people can sign up for notifications so that we were pulling names off of that. We've been pulling names from our service providers, our veteran services director, our um, our social workers, our other service providers we work with, um, really to try to find the, the people that we know can't get to Gillette or Fenway, that can't find a, a parking garage in Boston and get to Fenway. I think that was our concern. We don't want to have 96 year olds or 104 year olds going on an icy day and to um, sites that are just not safe. So um, we really tried to reach out and find those individuals. In addition to those um, vaccinations that we've been able to provide, we've also been able to you know, get people access to the VA system. So the VA has been a really big source for anyone that's a veteran. Um, so, so our veteran services director has been working around the clock to get those veterans in and vaccinated. Um, and our hospitals have been amazing as well. So Leahy and Mount Auburn have been able to get a lot of people appointments. So as our Council on Aging is calling people, a lot of the people on our list, the 75 and over list have been able to access appointments. So we're really just trying to hit those that have not had any, any luck. Um, I, I have to say, I think, um, I think the team's been quite successful. I think they started with a list of about 1200 and they've, they've, gone, they've gotten a pretty good way through um, that list, which is, um, been great. We're also doing senior housing, which is separate from this weekly allotment from DPH. We're going to get all of the vaccine we need for senior housing. So we're going to go in and, and vaccinate everybody in senior housing that needs it, uh, regardless of age. So that, that actually opens up in the next category. 
which is the category with the 65 and over. So they'll be done soon, hopefully. We'll be able to get that vaccine, which is about 600 doses. And we're excited to start that process soon. That, that's great. I just have one or two more questions, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Um, just a question for people who are gonna be waiting in, for future phases of vaccinations and, and you know, there still is a need for testing and a, and a need to, to be careful with precautions, but I'm just, for, for that group, and maybe this is just a, a request just to, to, to get out there, what, um, if there's gonna be any expansion of testing sites, and I know maybe the system is too strained as it is, but it's like we've got um, parallel things going on here and, and that there's still issues for the need for people to be tested, you know, if there are symptoms or, um, I wonder if you could talk about that briefly. So the state has the stop the spread testing sites. I, I do think testing is, another, it's, it's one of the most um, important tools that we have to prevent future cases. Um, so there is testing available through those sites. We also have a grant to do testing down um, at um, the Monotomy Manor site, as well as some of the senior housing sites. Um, so we've been, we did, we've done a round already at the Monotomy, um, Monotomy site. And so we will continue to do that. That's the CDBG grant, CDBG grant that came out. Um, so we accessed some funds through that and, and have been running that um, and will continue to do that. So anyone else that needs testing, um, we refer them to their physician to um, stop the spread sites. Um, there's also, there are also private pay locations that are um, accessible. So Pro EMS in Cambridge is an $80 test. Um, it's really just cost, the, the, the cost to them. So there are sites that we do refer people to. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and the last question that I have on top of everything else you're doing, I know you're overseeing the COVID relief fund and I'm wondering what, um, yeah, how, the, how that is going and, and maybe information um, if, if people need to, to try to access those funds, what they can do. Sure, um, I don't have the website right off the top of my head, but they can access the information on the town website, um, which can link to the, the COVID relief fund site. Um, so the COVID relief fund is available to anyone that's been impacted um, by COVID. So if they've lost their job or if hours have been cut back, or I mean, even with childcare issues, um, with schools not being fully in session, um, people may have may have a hard time um, just with uh, coverage and hours and whatnot at work. So I think, you know, we've been very successful in the funds we've raised. Um, we've been able to give out a, a significant amount of that money to help people in in serious need. Um, we've we've seen it. Um, we've seen the need grow uh, here in Arlington. Um, you know, despite. Um, you know, despite federal support and, and state supports, I think the local, um, just someone to pay their mortgage, you know, someone to pay their rent for the month or their car payment so that they can continue getting to work um, has been really helpful for, for people that have been um, negatively impacted. So thank you for bringing that up. Sure, no, thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, as Ms. Bongiorno knows, I have seen firsthand um, the clinic. I brought my parents who are in their 80s um, who signed up through the town website. I signed them up because they don't have a computer. They don't have internet. They're both deaf as, as I said before, any fish you can name. So even talking to them on the phone is a challenge. Um, and, um, you know, Ms. Christine, Natasha, uh, Kristen Shaw from Council on Aging, who are overseeing this and I, I know I'm gonna miss someone, but you know, APD, AFD, IT, DPW, COA, A, AHS. I wanna um, thank Ms. Bongiorno for not only having such a successful clinic, albeit we don't have um, as many vaccines that we could give out, um, but I know you say you're meeting every day or daily or weekly to see how you can do it better. And I'm, I know you are doing that, but um, you really had it right down to, you know, in terms of making sure, you know, especially amongst 80 to 100 plus, they tend to wander and, and having safe egress and explaining to them. And <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm so appreciative of that. Um, and, and I do know um, the clinic probably could handle at least a thousand a week if we had the vaccine. And I know um, the town manager, Mr. Chaplain Lane, has, has told me that. Um, he and um, 
our Health and Human Services Secretary, Ms. Mangiorno, have been contacting the state, imploring, imploring begging, pleading, whatever ING word um, to get it done. Um, and I'm just going to assume part of that is uh, contacting um, our reps, but especially our senator, because, you know, haven't have been in the state house. Senator Paul Feeney is a good friend of mine. He's down in Foxborough. It seems like, I, I hate to say this squeaky wheel. Um, uh, so I know you're exploring that, but that seems to be um, the uh, formula for um, going through that. I'm just a member of the select board. I'm always available to, for assistance, but um, that seems to be the one that, you know, if you can get the, that on board, which I'm sure you already are, but maybe um, ramp it up a bit. I do want to say that um, for seniors and people who are disabled in some way, who either don't have the technology or aren't as savvy and don't have a, a youngster family related, um, I have been giving out the um, Senior Center phone number of 781-316-3400 to call. Um, they can always call the select board's office and you know maybe it's a different um, town agency, maybe it does go to the Board of Health, but um, whatever way uh, I had um, posed this question and uh, Ms. Shaw had answered some of it and Ms. Bongiorno may have also answered it, but I have not checked my email since Friday. Um, a lot of people were saying, um, and I guess it would be to the town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine, is there, um, is it feasible and or applicable to use the town's robocall system um, to make a phone call to various constituents, residents in the town um, when the vaccine clinic uh, in Arlington expands um, to notify them of that. And, and what people have said to me, because people said, why don't you do a robocall once a week, once a month to everybody in town, especially around seniors. And then some people said, you know, well, can you do it so that you only call the seniors? Um, but my question would be, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, um, for those people, and perhaps it's an economic issue, who aren't able to get this information and maybe don't watch ACMI, um, I guess I'd leave it, unless you have an answer right now tonight, um, a lot of people are saying whether it's a robocall or a mailing um, to reach those people that aren't going to be reached through uh, technology. So I, I would say that we can look at that. I think I think whether or not we would choose that mode of communication would depend on how much supply we would receive from the state. I would be, it, with limited supply, I would be worried about calling broader swaths of the population, given that we wouldn't be able to meet the demand. But I think if supply opens up and we feel as though we have the need to make sure we're getting the right people into those seats to receive the vaccine, that that is a tool that we could use. Okay, thank you. And then um, I would just, it's sort of an inherent, I think, understanding with our new facilities director, Mr. Walters, that um, I know that um, Ms. Bongiorno and Mr. Feeney have worked hand in hand a lot on the schools. I'm, am I correct that that's just gonna carry over and, and that uh, professional relationship will still exist? Yes. And then um, my last question is, uh, I've gotten some emails and I've been referring them to the school committee chairwoman, um, Jane Morgan. Um, the, and, and this is something I'm, I'm not aware of, and um, Jane has sent me something, I haven't read it yet. I'm getting questions around, have we started or are we starting testing at the Gibbs, middle, Gibbs School for student and or staff? And if we are, if you could just give a sort of a brief of what that is, so partly I get the knowledge too. Sure, so the school system is managing um, pool testing of staff and students in various schools. It's a pilot. Uh, the pilot is being run in uh, nearly every uh, city and town across Massachusetts. I shouldn't say nearly, but a, a lot have joined. Um, this is a free pilot that, that is being rolled out. Um, there's been a, a, a pool testing collaborative uh, that um, a number of communities have come, up, come around 
um, to discuss since last August. Um, Arlington was a, a part of those conversations and um, I can't really speak to the details of it because it's being ruled out by um, the schools, Cindy, Cindy Sheridan Curran in particular, um, is sort of managing that whole process. And you know, obviously we provide support as we can, but, but yeah, that there is testing, um, pool testing going on. I think that, um, you know, pool testing is going to take uh, samples from an entire group of individuals. It's a, a much uh, cheaper way of testing and making sure we're, we're, we're pulling any positives out of the, the stream to prevent the future spread of the disease. Um, after a pool comes back positive, if a pool comes back positive, I can't speak to what's going on currently in the schools. I don't believe there were positive pools last week, um, but they're Binax testing each student, um, so individual testing to determine who the positive is so that then we can do our contact tracing and make sure we prevent future cases. So I hope that answers your question. No, it definitely does. And uh, thank you, Ms. Paterno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, uh, my kindergarten got tested today in class. He, he was very oh. excited to come up and tell us. He went around three times. So, but do they do, do they do the nose testing? Do you know, Mr. Hart? Or is that how they test? I know my second grader, the other cohort got tested and they all came back negative. And it's just great to see a little bit, you know, it's peace of mind. As we as you send the kids to school, so you know it's something that I think a lot of the, the parents were excited about. Not to jump in. Thank you. In there. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, Ms. Bongiorno. I mean, uh, you've been doing a great job. I mean, everyone. I just echo everyone on that. I mean, uh, I mean uh, I'm very confident in you and uh, the the rest of the department. Uh, and um, I also appreciate the cautious approach that uh, the town has has um, advocated all along. I mean, I mean, there's always pressures I mean, to open things faster or be looser, but but we we haven't done that, and I think that is a good thing. I mean, and so I'm very supportive of that. Uh, just a, a, a couple, uh, a few short questions. I mean, um, how are things going at with Anatomy Matter um, with respect to vaccinations, and and um, how do you anticipate perhaps uh, dealing with the population there in order to make sure that when vaccinations become more widely available, uh, they'll be in a position to take advantage of it. So I just want to clarify at Monotomy Manor, we did testing. We did a round of testing. Um, it went it went well. Um, it was on a Sunday. Um, we learned a little bit about maybe timing. I think we're going to do it during the week and maybe a little later in the day. So, um, you know, we have funding to continue doing that um, on a more regular basis and we'll continue to do it. As far as vaccinations, um, that's a, a, you know, an under 65 population living in that, that, um, that area. So we would not um, be vaccinating them until phase three, unless individuals fall into other phases before, um, such as healthcare workers or person 75 and over, I think there may be, um, you know, some residents that, that fall in those categories, but um, for the most part, they're, they're under um, phase three, likely. Gotcha. All right. I mean, but, but just kind of looking forward to, do you, are you anticipating being, I mean, I've just, I mean, I'm trying to be delicate in the way that I put the question, but also kind of get at the, the, the potential issue um, is that, are, are we looking at how to, make sure that the, the population over there gets mm -hmm. vaccinated. Yeah, sure. So um, in the past we have done flu clinics, uh, you know, we've, we use our flu vaccine, our flu uh, clinics as practice for pandemics. And here we are, you know, with the years of experience, we have run flu clinics in that um, area before to capture the population that, that um, you know, will, will definitely benefit greatly from, from the vaccine. So um, yeah, I mean, we'll, once we get to that point, we'll definitely be looking at um, some targeted clinics, some targeted advertising. So um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we've got a really good relationship, working relationship with the housing authority and the staff in that location. So it'll be um, it'll be a simple simple ask, a simple process. And also the Thompson School, the, the school staff there are amazing and um, being able to access that school for um, a site if needed would also be an opportunity for us as well. And here's maybe an opportunity to um, explain to people how they should behave I mean, after they get vaccinated, vaccinated and what the rationale is for being a uh, behavior that they might think is a little more um, um, intense than they would have thought otherwise. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. They're, um, a vaccination is not a ticket to, you know, 
do whatever you want. You can't, you know, get your, get your vaccine and go to dinner or, or you know, and, and feel say, um, as if you're invincible. There are definitely um, concerns about that. I think um, we know now uh, in Massachusetts, as of last Friday, there were seven people that tested positive for the variants. The variants are spreading fast. Um, we can assume there are more people out there with those. Um, we don't know how, um, you know how the the vaccinations will respond to those variants. So I think it's really important that that people continue to wear masks, continue to socially distance, and continue to be vigilant despite vaccinations. Um, you know, until we have a greater number of people in our communities vaccinated, we really have to continue to be vigilant. Um, you know, and, and until um, until we hear from the CDC that we're we're in the clear, I, I feel like um, we should just continue to to be aware that there is still risk. Right, and one of the other things that I, I've heard too is that, I mean, we're not really clear that when you get vaccinated that you still don't get a, the virus and then shut it, I mean, and so, so that's why I think they, another reason they're asking people when you're vaccinated, still continue to wear your mask because you may get it and still spread it to people who haven't been vaccinated. So, so, um, so um, just wanted to point that out. And if I'm incorrect about any of this, please point that out too. So. Um, and, um, no, you're correct. They can still spread it. And that's the concern that we would have. Thanks. And the, and the last thing, uh, and you give a short answer on this one. Um, has there been any modeling? I mean, um, is uh, the vaccination strategy, strategies, is this based on any modeling, I mean, as to various types of vaccinations, um, um, uh, strategies for lack of me being a little redundant. You know, I'll give you an example of, of, of what I'm getting at is that we are vaccinating the, the elderly people first, I mean, and people more vulnerable first. I, mean, I could see almost an argument I me mean, for you know, vaccinating those who um, uh, are, are likely to spread. I mean, uh, I mean it, it would seem like you're rewarding bad behavior, I mean, but for the younger people who just can't control themselves, and I understand that, I mean, and uh, <laughs> if they are likely to be the ones that spread, you could almost see the rationale of vaccinate them. And I understand that we don't know that people don't spread it, but let's say there's a probability that they don't. I mean, so I'm just wondering, has there been any like modeling to try, try to tease out what might be a better strategy? It's a little esoteric question if the answer is no. Yeah, that's, that's more of a, a state level or a federal level question, but I will say that the state, the, the Massachusetts plan uh, to vaccinate healthcare workers and, and individuals that are coming in contact with those that will likely um, have a really hard time getting over COVID has been, a, I think, a, a pretty positive strategy. Vaccinating the 75 and over population, that's where we see most of our hospitalizations and deaths. I have to say that I'm really eager to get them vaccinated. We're seeing our, our nursing home cases just basically at zero now after having both doses of vaccine. So, I mean, you know, there's arguments to be made to vaccinate the younger population, but right now I think that we really have to get our older population vaccinated or, or we're going to see still see deaths and hospitalizations. And we don't, you know, I, I, I just, I'm strongly advocating for continuing with the older population. Next, we go into 65 and over and two comorbidities. I think those are the other areas that will be high, extremely high risk. So I think that the, the getting these two groups vaccinated will, will help significantly in reducing our hospitalization rates. Great. And deaths. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I do just want to echo the comments that my other board members have made about the incredible work that you and the entire health department have done in the past year. It's, I've said this before, but you know, in the midst of this horrible virus, I feel like Arlington's really felt like a safe place to live or as safe as a place can be because of both the town staff and the residents. We have amazing residents who, who listen to the guidance that you provide. So I think that certainly helps. And I can attest from personal experience, we've had, you know, a few instances where we've had questions about exposures and the health department has been incredible in responding weekends, nights, we've, you can always get somebody on the phone in the health department to answer a question and it helps alleviate, you know, the, the stress when something like that happens. So I know, you know, I'm sure you've done that for many, many, many residents in town. So we do appreciate that as well. Um, one quick, so regarding the vaccinations that's coming up in the housing, you know, once that rolls out, is there sort of building on what Mr. Diggins had said, is there any feasibility to like a door to door type of vaccination approach as opposed to, you know, a, a clinic setup where just given the, 
the importance in housing to make sure everyone's vaccinated just for the health of the individual resident, but also the people that they live with. Is that anything that's been discussed or, or anything that could be a possibility? I think we lost you. Yep. Yep. I'm I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I guess a slow moment. Uh, no, we have our, our plans for housing um, all set and ready to go. We just need the vaccine. You know, we're we're going to do door to door. I think that's a great point because um, we know that um, our plan is to dispatch um, teams that will go floor to floor. Um, we have to have people wait 15 minutes after each dose. So we're going to bring chairs. Everybody will sit in the hallway in, in front of their door. St. Wolf carts. We have teams of nurses and EMTs. Um, we're just we're just waiting for the vaccine. So um, once we get it, we'll be able to um, go door to door to each of the sites. Um, you know, Winslow Tower, uh, Drake. You know, we've got a lot of large buildings. Um, you know, we're we're planning on doing that over the course of a number of days. Um, we have five sites, so we'll probably do one one site per day, possibly two sites if they're smaller on one day. Um, but it will take some time. I think that people just have to realize they have to be patient once we start that we'll get to everyone in housing i know that there's always concern that we didn't do their building yet and i think that's where we have to make sure people understand we will get there we will do it within one week and um we're very we're just as eager as them to get the vaccine in them so yeah sure then i was watching cnn this morning i was very interested to be see that there was a speaker speaking from arlington Her name was olivia adams i'm sure it came across your 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 radar by now and she created a website for Massachusetts. Have we had any discussions with Olivia about helping connect our residents with that site or is that something that could be a resource for us? We have certainly been using that in the Council on Aging. Adam, I don't know if you want to speak to Joan's efforts and reaching out to her. Yeah, so we actually were in communication with Miss Adams today. Uh, Joan Roman reached out to her and uh, I, I don't know if it's been posted yet, but our plan is to post a link to uh, that site on the town website uh, and, and likely, uh, excuse me, included in our communication later this week as well. Certainly a proud moment for the town. Yeah. And testament yeah. to our residents that, that someone created something not, it looks like not just Massachusetts will be using, but potentially many other states in the country. So that was a cool thing to see. Um, well, with that, I want to thank Mrs. Bongiorno for joining us and the update and all the work that you do. And um, good night. All right. Next is the consent agenda. We have reappointments to the Board of Youth Services, term to expire January 31st, 2024, Joan Axelrod. Commission on Arts and Culture, also term to expire January 31st, 2024, Stephanie Marlin Curiel. To the Disability Commission, Carrie Fallon. And to, to the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission, Brooks Harrelson, all, both terms to expire January 31st, 2024. We also have for approval, Arlington Reads Together Banners, Anna Litton, Assistant Director, Robbins Library. So, Mr. Chaplain, do we have anyone from the library that wanted to speak to this? Uh, they, they were not um, able to make it uh, to the meeting tonight, no. And if any of the three appointments, we don't generally have required people to be present, but if you would like to speak, you can use the raise hand function on your Zoom application right now. Seeing none, I will take a motion. Mrs. Mahan? Full approval. Mr. Corsi? Second. Stiggins, any additional comments? Nope. Thank you very much. Attorney Hine? On the motion by uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. And that takes us to item number six on our agenda. This is now 7.30 p.m. RCN Cable Television License Transfer to Stone Speak Associates for LLC. Attorney Hyman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to note very briefly uh, in advance of the presentation uh, by, the, uh, by the applicant for transfer that uh, the 
basic nature of this is uh, uh, only limited to uh, the transfer of this license from basically one parent company which uh, holds RCN to a new parent company which holds RCN. Um, it's not similar to a renewal. So there's nothing on the table with respect to programming or anything reg uh, regarding PEG access. It's basically limited to uh, basically vetting whether or not there's any reason to be concerned about these, these folks' ability to financially, legally, technically, or from a management perspective, own RCN and continue to operate it as if they stood in the shoes of uh, the, the, the current owner of RCN. So um, I'll let these folks uh, make their presentation. Uh, you've received some uh, information uh, about the applicant that is uh, under the law allowed to be kept confidential because it's uh, primarily uh, things like that are financial in nature. Uh, and obviously if the board has any questions or the public has any questions, they should feel free to ask the applicant. But with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to the applicant to, to make their pitch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we'll turn to Mr. Nielsen and Mr. Steele. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Thomas Steele. I am Vice President and Regulatory Counsel for RCN, have been for all these years. Uh, we were happy to serve Arlington some 20 years ago and had a couple of renewals since then. So we, uh, and we have our regional office down the street. So I venture into the town quite a bit. And although not lately, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, as, as Doug said, we're here tonight to talk about a change in ownership. In 2010, uh, RCN was uh, bought by an investment company and the investment company hired a management team, Patriot management team to run the company. In 2016 and 17, they, the company was sold to another investment company and the management team was asked to stay on. Now in 2021, we have yet another investment company looking to uh, buy their interest in the company. And they too are asking the management team to stay on. So as Mike will tell you shortly, uh, nothing much is going to change from your perspective while there, but there is a, a transfer and control at the very top. Uh, however, indirectly it affects our business that requires us to uh, have this hearing and seek your approval. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Nielsen who will, uh, speak as Stone Peak, our new buyer representative. Mike. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Mike Nielsen. I'm with a law, a little law firm down here in Washington, DC. <clears throat> and I'm speaking on behalf of Stone Peak, who is the transferee in this transaction. Um, look, we've submitted you know, extensive materials, which we've had the chance to look at. I, I think rather than walking you through all of those materials, let me just briefly describe kind of what I think the transaction is about. Uh, and why I think it shouldn't be of, of concern to you. Um, so the first and probably the most important point is that from your perspective as RCN's franchise authority, nothing changes at all, right? Um, as, as Tom mentioned, this is an indirect ch change of control, the ultimate owner of RCN. RCN will remain uh, the franchisee. RCN will remain responsible for compliance with the franchise. RCN will remain, um, uh, a, a business in the same way it is a business today. And so, um, and, and I think what that also means is that you can look to RCN itself, both in terms of its uh, financial and its legal qualifications to run a cable system, uh, which were beyond question. Um, RCN will remain and it will remain and it has its own financial books that you can look to and, and its own legal qualification to run a cable system. Um, Second, from the customer's short-term perspective, again, uh, uh, nothing changes at all, right? Um, unlike some private equity situations where you go around looking for a distressed asset that, you're, that you think you need to fix, in this case, Stone Peak chose RCN uh, precisely because it thinks it's a very well-managed and run cable system competitive cable system competing with the, the incumbents. And, and so Stone Peak has no plans to change the management and it has no plans to change the operations. And, and so from the perspective of kind of what's happening uh, for the consumer, um, you know, the day this closes, nothing changes. Um, and again, in, in, so in terms of the managerial qualifications, uh, again, you can continue to look at the excellent management 
uh, of RCN and, and, and in particular Tom Steele, who's, we're not gonna let him go anywhere. Um, I, I've known Tom for 15 years and, and we're not gonna let him go anywhere. Um, but the good news is that from the medium to long-term perspective, um, this, the transaction kind of gives you the prospect for better service. And, and, and again, unlike some other private equity situations, Stone Peak has a history of holding on to assets a little bit longer. Uh, it has a history of providing them with managerial and, and more importantly, financial resources and helping them grow. Um, that sort of Stone Peaks, uh, 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 the way that Stone Peak kind of kind of thinks of this stuff. So um, most recently in, in, in the telecom space, there's a company called Extinet, which uh, uh, provides equipment used for um, for wireless carriers in areas where they need extra capacity. Right now. And, and, and Stone Peak has held on to Extinet and kind of helped it grow. And so that's sort of the idea here. And, and it manages 29 billion of its investors' uh, uh, funds. And so um, it, it, it uh, um, again, the idea of the transaction is to make more resources available. And again, that can only help in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, improving the network, in terms of improving the management, in terms of um, um, whatever it is that they decide to use those resources for. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is that, you know, if, if you've taken a look at the application, it has a fairly complicated uh, um, corporate structure. And, and I wanted to sort of relieve your in any concerns you might have, you know, the ultimate control goes to Michael Durrell, who's Stone Peak's co-founder. And, 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 and that's kind of where all the action is. There are a lot of boxes and arrows on the org chart because there are, and there will be addition, uh, additional passive investors um, because one of the things that that that, uh, that happens in private equity is you go around and you find you know co-investors uh, to help you kind of fund uh, you know uh, to fund transactions and to fund investments and so that process continues but those are those are passive investors so they're not going to affect what I think matters to you the most which is kind of who's the person who's ultimately 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 in charge that's Michael Durrell but again um, RCN is going to kind of remain where it is and who it is. And so, uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have, um, um, and happy to be of any help that I can that, that I can possibly be. Thank you. With that, we'll turn to the board. After we go through the board members, we'll open it up to the public for any questions or comments or any comments. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so you know, I appreciate you, know, you saying that Stone Peak will have a tendency to um, hang on to um, its investments longer, uh, because it does strike me um, as curious that there's been a number of transfers uh, recently. It's not particularly a problem, and, and I understand why it is that uh, you want to buy me. But do you, can you give some maybe insight as to why the sellers want to sell? Um. Um, I really don't mean to be glib. Um, I'm not the seller's lawyer, and 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 so um, and 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 so I don't know why TPG um, wanted to sell. Um, um, I, I can. May I may I engage in some rank speculation? Sure, please. Happy to do it. Uh, there's a press report saying that TPG is negotiating with AT and T to buy Directv, and so it's possible that this. The price of this allowed them to do that. Now, why they would want to do that, you know, I, 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 I don't know. But that is, that is, you know, again, uh, rank speculation. But that's that may be what's going on. I hear you. And well, uh, more directly, I mean, that was just my curiosity question. Sure. You know, on page twelve, uh, you, you you mentioned how this uh, proposed transaction will serve the public interest. Uh, can you just expand or or just? Elucidate me for those who haven't read this. The sure. one is that uh, uh, what your purchase is going to serve the, serve the public interest. Sure, and, and look, there, there's there's always two ways to answer this. Like the first thing that you want to to know, I think, as a regulator, is that there aren't any. It's not going to cause any problems, right? This is not a this is not a, it's not a combination that causes competitive concerns. It's not an owner with a history of treating its investments badly, right? So, so sort of so. I, I hope we can take that as a given. And then again, you know, um, um, the idea here is that um, that if you make additional resources available, which which is is kind of, let me back up here. Uh, um, 
TPG, who was the 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 the, um, uh, the, the, the ultimate, I guess, transfer. Uh, they looked at several bids, right, on this, and 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 I can tell you because I actually saw Stone Peak's bid. One of the things that Stone Peak emphasized is that its interest was sort of in in kind of in in in, in helping the asset grow as opposed to kind of getting in getting out and taking some money right and and that was you know in, in the in the cover letters that was sent that was that was sort of in the way that they did the bid um, and so again um, if you have an entity that is well funded like Stone Peak is and you have an entity that has a history of making financial investments or making financial resources available to its investments you know then those are things that you can use again you know, you know, faster broadband speeds, a, a better network. Maybe you're extending fiber out into different places. Um, maybe you are, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're investing in your call centers. Maybe you are investing, um, you know, in terms of additional programming that you couldn't have done before. Um, these are all things that you can do. Those discussions about exactly what you want, what you will do, They've barely started, and I think that the, the the real meat and potatoes of those discussions happen after you close. But I think again, if you have financial resources to 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 bring to bear, that's just a good thing. So that's the basic story of why this is a, is a public interest benefit: is that you just have a better competitor to Comcast and the others. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, on the letter, that, that uh, the cover letter for the application, that's dated November 30th. And there's a reference to a 120 day period that if we don't take any action, it's a, an effective grant of the application. When does a 120, when did that begin? Does it begin as of the hearing or, or as of the date that we received your letter? It's the date, the date that we submit the complete application. So that should have okay. been that date. Okay, all right. And then a question for, um, and I see, thank you for um, including a draft resolution with the letter, uh, just a question for town council. Um, and, and this just goes to whether we take any action, just let the 120 days run or we sign the resolution, uh, approve the resolution. Do we have any issues with the resolution? It, it seems like it's a, a boilerplate type uh, situation, but I, if there are any, I might as well get them on the table. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Chrissy, I don't see any issues with the resolution. I think at the end of the day, again, uh, whether you passively allow the transfer, you affirmatively uh, support the transfer, um, the, the, the real crux of this is, is the board satisfied that um, RCN uh, gets to maintain its posture as a real asset to the town as a cable franchise? Um, okay. so. I mean, I don't Thank know if has a position on that, but but I certainly don't have any issues with the resolution. Yeah, no, that 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 that's fine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and Mrs. Mon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, I might have drifted off <laughs> during that, but um, it, is Attorney Heim suggesting that we do vote this, or we let the 120 days pass and it's deemed accepted? I think it's my understanding from the applicant that they'd like you to endorse, um, that they'd like your endorsement. And I think that provides a little bit of timely finality to something that they're trying to uh, complete and puts RCN in the best position um, that it can be in. And again, I think that overall, just to really condense all this stuff, the whole point of this is everybody wants to make sure, as everybody knows, it's very valuable to have three viable cable franchises in a community. I can say that with a little bit of levity, uh, living in a community that only has one, it's not great. Uh, uh, so, um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that you're in you're in, you're in good shape as long as you're satisfied that there's nothing to be concerned about about this company's ability to maintain our scene. Okay, um, since I have the platform, I just would put it out there. Um, I don't know if Mr. Steele can speak to this or maybe speak to it when the contract comes up with all of our uh, cable providers. I just wanted to put a, a, a pitch, a plea in for, um, especially in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there are a very small minority 
set of user groups, especially around churches, because of the way um, the contract is written, not just with RCM, but the other two providers that um, they're not guaranteed sort of service upgrades. Um, and I'm not sure if Mr. Steele is aware of this. I know different churches have contacted different providers, but I, I just wanted to kind of po pose that, put, put that out there um, that, you know, this may not be the appropriate time to have the conversation and have an answer to it, as well as um, make, make Attorney Nielsen aware. Um, it's, it's, I think it's the way the um, contract was originally drafted, I think with just the original continental cable somehow very small user groups um, and then a lot of them are churches who are now trying to upgrade. Um, they weren't included in that group and it's, it's made it harder for them to kind of maneuver that um, and, and get that service upgrade. So i um, not saying you should have an answer to that, but I just want it since I have the captive captured audience, um, just uh, make you all aware of that, uh, especially with moving forward um technology is you know as it would be whether there was COVID-19 or not technology is more important there's a very small minority user group there and then um my other question would be and I did read the um application for transfer and um in terms of I, I was looking for it maybe perhaps in section b on pages 12 or 13 and 14 that talk about sort of um, the crux of where I'm going. Uh, again, I don't know either Attorney Nielsen and or Mr. Steele. Uh, my question would be, I understand that um, there's an agreement to keep um, RCN and the management team in place. Once this uh, contract transfer for control is, is executed, is there, I don't see any language in there that says if you decided one day, one month, one year after that, that you wanted to change everything, uh, does that allow you, you to do that? Um, if, if you do decide to do that, um, is there some sort of a notification to the town and do we have any seat at the table to speak to that? I'm not saying you're not going to stay true to your commitment. I, I just don't see, and I'm not an attorney, but I just don't see the language in there that specifies. It says, you know, the intent to retain RCN and its management team, but I, I didn't see any sort of finality to that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I want to make sure that I'm answering this sort of carefully, and 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 so that that I I'd like to remain Stone Peaks lawyer um, in the future, and 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 not talk. Um, um, I don't think that there's anything in the purchase agreement itself that says. You know, um, we're yeah. we are, you know, keeping Tom Steele for five years, or we, are, or, 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 or anything of that nature. Um, and so, I don't know that there's something like in the agreement itself that you would look to, sort of, as a lawyer, and say, you know, we are bound to do that. On the other hand, you know, we have been running around Massachusetts telling everybody the same thing that we've told you. You know, we are, we are making it pretty clear that this is sort of our intention is to not change anything and not change the management. So, um, 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 I, you know, I, I never want to say what my client could do at some point if circumstances were changed. Um, but I think that we've we've been pretty clear that we like what's going on and we're going to keep it. And I think uh, it would be I think it would be hard for them um, if all of a sudden uh they tried to pull a bait and switch. I, I, I think uh, I, I think that would be hard for them. So, is that a fair answer? It's actually very fair, and you've answered my question that there's not language in there. Um, and because I've read everything, and I am a court reporter, so a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Understood. Um, and so, I, I think those three steps out. So, the the only part of it, and if you can't answer this, I understand because you're an attorney for Stone Peak. Uh, maybe Attorney Heim, and not two of my colleagues are attorneys. Um, because I don't see it in there, if um, which it would be Stone Peaks, right? If they do choose, um, for some reason, they all of a sudden got brainwashed and decided to do a 180 on that. Do we, the town of Arlington, for our customers here, have any 
legal protection or legal options or rights that we somehow get notified and we have a say in that process or is it there's no language in here i can i don't see it and it's a good faith effort i think that your remedy would go more to the the franchise agreement itself which has a certain level of certain again i've it, i spent october and november looking at hundreds of these agreements so i can't tell you what's in yours but your franchise agreement, you know, these are pretty specific things about the level of service they're going to provide. Most of them have a provision, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, what was the, the phrase? Uh, it was almost like a technical most favored nation, whereas if, if somebody else offers something kind of a better service, then, then it, again, I don't know if that's in yours. So I think your legal remedy, if you wanted to talk about legal remedy, would be under your franchise agreement. But, but my sense of all of this is that, that uh, um, you know, uh, um, if we're a year from now and, 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 and you guys are thinking about your legal remedy against RCN, um, uh, things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. That's not the way this ought to work out. And so, uh, but, I, but to answer your question, I think you would look to your franchise agreement. And if I could, through you, Mr. Sure. Chair, Attorney Heim, is there anything you can sort of guide me on that? No. Um, I want to be very clear that, that the answer, I, I hope that uh, Mr. Steele uh, knows how much uh, Arlington appreciates him based on uh, this dialogue. And I think uh, having uh, been part of the negotiations with the table franchise agreement and the, the frankness and the efficiency with which Mr. Steele handled those things, um, I think it's well-deserved as well as much of his, uh, what he's done uh, within this community. I, I, I agree that the, um, that, 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 that the major thing that I think folks should take away from this is that somebody wanted to buy this business because of it's being run because it's being run well rather than uh, the other way around so because the business is being acquired the, the, the major carrot is to keep the rc and team the way it is because it's doing well uh, in terms of our remedy i don't want to sugarcoat it i don't think that we have a specific right to say this team um has to stay in place. I don't think that we ultimately will have that right, um, even if you were not to approve the transfer. Um, I, I, I think that we would be entitled or we would put ourselves in a certain negotiating position if uh, when the camp, cable franchise renewal comes up, uh, if we felt like we were not being dealt with fairly and honestly. So I think that's, that's our real, um, stick. I don't think it's so much that we're going to be able to say we get to choose who's on their team. It's more um, you want us to negotiate the next franchise agreement. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nielsen is correct that there, there are um, provisions in that where we basically have the right to go to RCN if there's some piece that Comcast is offering us or something like that. It's different, but um, I don't think that one of those things would be the management team. I think it would be more, hey, look, you know, we are negotiating the cable franchise agreement. Um, we really like the team that we had. You guys put that team to the curb. Um, that's informing our our position in terms of how we negotiate. That, that's what I would say. Okay, I thank long you. Answer for that. okay. Um, so I'd like to move approval of the resolution for the consolidated application for consent to transfer control of section 214. Just throw up for a second, Mr. Corsi. Second. Yeah. And I would just add to the discussion that Attorney Heim just said, is that any of the, the options and remedies that the new owner is gonna have is, is the same options or remedies that the current owner would have had if, for instance, they don't like the way if the location in Arlington isn't working or the management team isn't working, they would still have the same option. So it doesn't, it's not expanded with the transfer agreement. Um, I, based on the materials, have, have no issues with the, the new owner. And I know RCN is re a really important entity in town. Uh, many residents like to say how easy it is to just go and drop the cable boxes off, right? Right there on Mass Ave, and we see the trucks and we see the workers at Duncan's in the Heights all the time. So, so they really are a part of the, our community. So we want to make it very easy for you guys to continue to be a part of the community. So I'm certainly happy to support that. 
At this time, if there's any members of the public that wish to comment, could you use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now? All evidence of a very thorough conversation. So with that, we have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Heim? Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Unanimous vote. And thank you both for sticking with us. 50 minutes past here, a lot at start time. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. Today. Thank you. It was worth the wait. Over there, though. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Bye guys. All right, so that takes us to appointments. We have three appointments to the Arlington Committee on Tourism and Economic Development. All terms to expire December 31st, 2022. We have Christopher D'Angelo, James Burns, and Michelle Deacon. Can you promote all three? All right, so I'll give you each a few minutes just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve on the commission. Then we'll go to the board to uh, ask any questions they may have collectively. Uh, so I'll start with Mr. D'Angelo. Hey, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here tonight. I, uh, I'm fairly new to Arlington, actually. So my wife and I moved here about a year ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, which was great or terrible timing, depending on your perspective, I guess. Um, but, it, you know, it's been great to be, to be here and to be in this town. And I think one of the things that stuck out to us is how welcoming our, neighbor, our neighbors have been. We're up here on Mount Vernon Street. And it's uh, just been a real pleasure to, to be able to become involved and, and be part of this crew here, even at a distance. Um, I think where, uh, where we were coming from before, we were down in North Carolina, I was getting my MBA, and then we moved up to Boston for my job. Uh, in terms of my desire to be uh, part of ATED, it comes down to um, the immediate feeling of kind of being connected to the neighborhood. And then in my uh, past life, before uh, my current role, I was working on Capitol Hill and I had the opportunity to do a lot of work um, with uh, the District of Columbia, kind of working in different economic economic development issues there um, that were you know very fascinating and, and I thought uh, important to the district. And so seeing that opportunity to do it within my no my own neighborhood, my own home, uh, really hit home and felt like a great way to stay connected, great way to serve the community, uh, and to join with my neighbors who have welcomed us with open arms into uh, into this town. Thank you. And Mr. Burns. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, so I am a, uh, a two-year uh, Arlington resident. I live in East Arlington near the Capitol Theater with my wife and three-year-old three daughter, who is thankfully asleep right now. Uh, by day, I am an attorney for QuickBooks, um, small business software. So I make I update and maintain uh, a lot of the tax rules that are within the software. And I work directly with a lot of small businesses who use the software, either testing out new features or troubleshooting problems that they're having. And I find that part of the job very enjoyable, helping out small businesses, which is why I uh, am, would like to serve on this committee. Uh, I love, you know, especially COVID times supporting the, uh, the local businesses that are either a short drive or a very short walk uh, from our house. Uh, so uh, trying to just carry forward some of the work I've been doing during the day into back into the community, helping out the small businesses of the town. Thank you. And Ms. Deacon. So I think you need to uh, unmute yourself there. Yep. Thank you. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without somebody not unmuting themselves. So well, I've already wanted to make sure I did that. Um, I'm really pleased to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, 
I love Arlington and um, I'm really excited for the opportunity to serve on this committee to try to get the word out about uh, why other people should spend time here, spend money here. Um, I am a writer by trade and a public relations professional and I currently am the communications director for the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation, um, which provides civil legal aid for um, low income people in Massachusetts, provides funding for um, organizations that provide civil legal aid. And I do a lot of uh, work with websites and social media. So what I do is get the word out. And I thought if I can help Arlington with that, I'd be very happy to spend my time doing that. Thank you. And I will turn to the board, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Ms. Deacon, for taking my forgetting to unmute myself task first. Um, um, to, to all three of you, um, first, I'd like to move approval. Um, secondly, um, I have not followed as closely as I, as I was in the beginning, um, the minutes um, in um, workings of the Tourism and Economic Development Committee. So the two things I mentioned may already be in place, but since you're new members and also have different areas of expertise, um, given the current economic um, situation that um, Arlington businesses and uh, by absentia residents are facing right now, uh, I know that the town has received on the federal level through the Community Development Block Grant Program, CDBG, um, monies um, specifically geared towards um, maybe not so much tourism and maybe that should change, but definitely economic development. So if there already is an existing relationship between um, the Committee on Tourism and Economic Development and the CDBG committee, that's great. If not, um, whoever is the person that does the admin role um, could contact Mallory Sullivan, who is uh, works for the planning department. And the other reason I say that, I have something that I'm, um, when we first started getting uh, federal CDBG monies and we offered the programs in the traditional way, um, we didn't have a great pool of applicants. And a lot of it was because kind of similar to what we're seeing with COVID-19 vaccines, um, but with uh, business owners and small business owners, again, not having access and English as a second language and um, the planning department and myself and a few volunteers went and did the outreach safely. Um, and also, you know, made available that they could call the town and get translation services. So I don't know if that's, and you can speak to the committee, if that's something that maybe you all could be a resource for. Um, it, you know, it wasn't a lot of work, but it was just, you know, connecting with, you know, what needs you have, there is some relief through the federal government. And then likewise, um, as you begin your work on um, the committee, there are a lot of state programs that again, our planning department has knowledge of and gets the word out. Um, but there's also, you know, grant writing opportunities. Um, so maybe that this committee could look at that to see if, if you're a standalone entity that could apply for those state grants, or if again, in concert with our planning department with Jenny Rate, our, our planning director, um, sort of be there. My only thing is I, I don't want to have a op missed opportunity of relief that's out there. So um, it may go beyond the charge of this particular committee, but to me, it seemed like it's sort of like a partner in there. So again, like the previous speakers, you're, you're a captive audience. So I'm taking advantage of that opportunity. And I look forward to seeing um, seeing you at Zoom. Can't wait till we can see each other actual, at actual meetings when we're all safe, vaccinated and, and socially distancing. Um, and again, thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can tell you both the CDBG and ATED share the same select board designee. I don't know how well he does it connecting the two entities, but we also do have um, our Ali Carter, our economic development coordinator from the planning department serves as a liaison. She's on the committee often. So we bounce ideas for economic development off of her and rolls into the planning department. All right, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, second, Mrs. Mahan's motion. And I wanna thank each of you for your willingness to serve on the uh, Tourism and Economic Development Committee. 
Um, Mr. D'Angelo, welcome to Arlington. I know that you haven't been here long. Thank you for, for stepping up, Mr. Burns. Thank you as well. And um, Ms. Deacon, nice to see you again. Our, our sons played hockey over the years. I used to see you a lot the, at the hockey rink, but uh, it's nice to see you in this setting. And um, it, it, I think it's great. Each one of you brings some different experience um, to the committee. So thank you so much for, uh, for your willingness. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, and I'll just echo my colleagues and thank, express gratitude for you all um, stepping up into this role. And I'll also express my regret because I, mean, I didn't see resumes. You know, you know, maybe I just missed them, but usually when um, we, we get these kind of appointments, I mean, we get to see resumes and be even more impressed I mean, by the caliber of people who um, or, or going for these positions. But anyways, thank you very much, I mean, and economic development. Uh, I, I, I enjoy talking uh, and thinking about that. And so I look forward to interacting with you in some way or another over the years. Thanks again. Yep. And thank you all again for your willingness to serve. Um, I do serve on this committee and I will see you guys on meetings very soon. Um, it's, it's really, it's a great group of people to start off with a lot of a combination between people that have been in town for a long time that can speak to events that we had in 1976 at the at the bicentennial and people that have just moved into town that, that have new ideas about how we can spread tourism and economic development when i first got on the committee we really in often we focus on tourism um, but right now we're really shifting on economic development and how the committee can brainstorm ideas to help get the word out for local businesses and help get people in new doors and help promote our local businesses. So that's something that I think all three of you bring a wealth of knowledge to, and I certainly look forward to working with all, you all. So with that, we have a motion to approve by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Han. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Yannis vote. Thank you all. All right, that takes us to our open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made. The night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. If you would like to speak at our open forum, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. Going once, going once. So we have one speaker, Ms. Milofchuk. All right, so we will have one speaker. We could promote Ms. Milofchuk. Ms. Malofchik, can you hear us? Hello, yes, thank you. If you could just say your name for the record. Beth Malofchik, uh, Russell Street Town Meeting Member, Precinct 9. <clears throat> um, many of my constituents have lost work and or have reduced income due to COVID. Um, and so um, uh, curious, um, We've heard or read about the uh, recent finance committee meeting and the projected or forecasted potential override of 13 to $15 million in 2023 or 2024. And so I'd like to ask whether any budget cuts are being considered. And um, I understand that town manager has significant outside responsibilities so I'd like to ask whether a portion of the town manager's income is being paid by Metropolitan Area Planning Council, Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, their affiliates or sponsors. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and that closes our open forum. Takes us to traffic rules and order in other business for discussion, future select board meetings. All right. I 
actually don't have my calendar in front of me as to where we are now. Can someone throw out what meetings we have scheduled? We have one for the 22nd. So 22nd, yeah. Two weeks from now, that's the last one scheduled. Right. The next thing about March is that it lines up the same way as February in terms of date, day of the month and day of the week. So we have the 22nd. And could I ask you, Mr. Chair, yep. either directly or through you, um, and maybe it can't be answered tonight, but uh, in terms of the amount of Warren article hearings we need to have, if we, we're going to keep just doing them Monday nights at infinitum, which means depending on what I see right now, I don't know if all five Mondays in March will cover it or, or if there's something else being contemplated. So I'm open to the experience of the members of the board to see what will look like as the warrant closes or as the warrant gets finalized. Um, do you have a Perhaps a attorney Heim who probably doesn't know 100% of the amount of warrant articles, but has a pretty good sense right now. Uh, will our typical Monday night meetings and or Monday, Wednesday night meetings or, or something else, or, or can we continue business as usual? So, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, it is gonna be tight this year. There are, um, we're looking at a warrant in the high 80s, most likely. Um, and there are somewhere between 13 and 14 resolution type articles alone for the select board to consider. Um, along with about 13 um, or so bylaw amendments and probably somewhere between six and 10 um, home rule or um, it's not exactly clear. There, there's a bunch of articles that are, that are essentially votes um, either because there's something like a school committee stipend article where you town meetings only required action is a vote um, to set a stipend if a uh, town meeting is so inclined, or there are things that are, um, it's not 100% clear how the applicants, I mean, how the uh, petitioners uh, propose to proceed on a specific matter and they've, they've sort of articulated their, their warrant articles as vote. So, you know, you're looking at um, somewhere in the mid 30s to 40s uh, or to, to, to low 40s for warrant articles. Um, I do think a lot of them could potentially be tackled uh, in one sitting if uh, the board, you know, is willing to have a sort of later night and has a lighter agenda. For example, if the board could figure out a way to get most of the resolutions in on one night, the legal posture of resolutions is very straightforward. Um, it just depends a lot on how many speakers uh, want to speak to a specific warrant article in the hearing. So my guess is, is that it could be done with some longer nights, um, but that it is certainly possible, if not likely, that some sort of supplemental meeting whether you decide to do that as a Monday and a Wednesday, or you decide to do that in some other fashion, is, is, is probably going to be necessary. Okay. Um, I, here's my suggestion in terms of setting um, meetings for March, April, and May. I'm assuming at least that far out that we set the traditional select board um, where we meet typically every other mo Monday. Um, but that the chair, Mr. Hurd and attorney Heim um, have a conversation, communication, um, and perhaps in order to, uh, as an adjunct to that, um, sort of discuss having uh, an additional select board meeting. Uh, I think there was conversation about, you know, perhaps having one day designated to a certain category or a mixture of categories, resolutions or whatever. And it's, you know, we do it on a different day of the week and perhaps start at, you know, nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and go to some time in the afternoon. So that would A, involve the chair and town council looking at the um, Warren articles 
to say, you know, um, if we do, um, instead of having meetings that go to midnight or even longer, um, where we're, um, I know I'm not giving my best at, at, at 1230 at night, and I want to make sure we are, um, look into the possibility of uh, calling the board and, and working with the town manager, maybe this that one day um, select board meeting. Um, and, and I'm not looking for a marathon session, but I know if you get me from nine or 10 o'clock in the morning till, till three or four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd like to cut it off at four. Um, you know, with a break in between, if we can, um, especially around the resolutions that, I mean, this, this is a high number of hearings that we have to have as well as uh, I anticipate um, they're gonna be not five, 10 minute um, items. So is, is that okay, Mr. Chair, if you, if you and Attorney Heim sort of look into that? So right now, so if we do that, we have March 8th, March 22nd, and then we can look at the warrant to determine what, if any additional meetings that would be needed. We could go to March, I mean, April 5th, which would be two weeks after the 22nd. Then we will have to meet on the 12th as that would be our traditional structural meeting. Okay, so um, I, in, I'm okay with it. Um, in March, I'm, I'm fine with March 8th and 22nd. I don't know about Mr. Diggins or Mr. DeCourcy. Well, I, I was gonna suggest to me that we maybe line up all the Mondays in March you know, I'm not, a, I'm hard pressed to say that I'm going to be available, meet you know, any weekday or Saturday, you know, to meet, you know, my days are, my days are pretty stacked, you know, and so I'd rather do me more, um, more night times, I mean, I would say do every Monday in March, if we wrap up early, that would be good, because that means we could get the report out to the, the town meeting members early, because I remember coming to these select board meetings and asking, can we get that report early so that we can talk to um, and, uh, our precinct to our meet so when we have our precinct meetings and we can really talk about a, the select board report. I mean, so so and then we could have we, we could have shorter nights, you know, um, and just kind of line up March. If we done if we're done early, then we can not have I mean, some meetings in March. So that's my alternative suggestion. Well, that, that would be tough for me because <laughs> I have other things that, okay, I, I want to hear from my colleagues. Well, that's fine. So I didn't understand. I didn't realize that, Ms. Ms. Um, I, I didn't realize that would be a difficulty for you. So since that's the case to me, then, then I pull back from being so um, enthusiastic about that. But I hear you. Thanks for letting me know. Well, yeah. I, I, can, I can just say March 29th would not be possible for me. But if we wanted to do four Mondays, I, I, I'll leave. Can, how about tonight, Mr. Chair? We, can we definitely do eight and 22? Yep, assuming that those two dates work for Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Diggins. Yeah. Mr. Yeah, that's fine. And Mr. DeCourcy, and then, thoughts on, I mean, if you want to put down eight, 22 in the fifth, then the 12th, I think traditionally we schedule out to our structural meeting. Um, I don't know unless I'm wrong. Well, can I suggest that we do 822 in March, 512 and 26th in April. The 26th is um, the hour before town meeting. Um, and it's just things that, that definitely need to happen. And yep. then we also do one, two, uh, May 3rd, which we have to have the Monday after the, um, wait, when's the town election? Oh, no, we, get, we have that covered. April 10th. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So we have 822 in March and 512 in April. And then if we need to add more Monday nights, and then as a last resort, if we need to look at some other meeting day or time, if we can't get it done. And um, just the 29th is difficult for me. Yep. And as always, we can, if a Monday night doesn't work, we can figure out another, Wednesday or no. another night that works. But why don't we just put those in the schedule now and then we'll all connect with the training time to see what the what the warrant looks like and what we anticipate longer hearings to see if it'll be sufficient or if we need to add meetings we can do so yeah and and, and I'll, I'll request that we add the meetings earlier rather than later 
because we, if I schedule something, we, I'll have to blow it out I mean, in order to attend these meetings because this does take priority. I mean, so to the extent I can avoid having that happen, that would be really great. I mean, so as soon as we know, uh, let's just block out those dates. And if we don't need them, we don't need them. But I'd rather block out those dates and not schedule something for them than to schedule something than to have to you know, break that obligation because of this higher obligation. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll talk to Attorney Heim in the next by the next meeting to have a, an additional item on this to okay. discuss. Appreciate it. Dr. Corsi? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's fine. I think we can wait and until that discussion, I was going to say, we'll know by the 22nd if we're way behind. And maybe if you want to hold off on a date, hold off on the 24th, 24th and 31st. Mrs. Mahan said she's not available on the 29th. And maybe we have the meeting, maybe we don't. But we should know by the beginning of the meeting on March 22nd if we're going to need to add more nights. Yep. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just want to note that uh, both Ashley and Lauren and your office have done a great job. We had a fairly long meeting this morning to start discussing scheduling more in articles. So they, they are on top of it. It's just going to be a volume issue. So I'm available all these times, of course, and any uh, supplemental times you folks need, uh, I'll be I'll be ready. Thank you. Thank you. And we do not need a vote for that item. So that will take us to item number nine, Chief Information Officer Search Process. Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Bird. I try to try to unmute myself and I close the window there for a second. Sorry about that. As long as you don't kick me out of the Zoom again. No. <laughs> I, I almost kicked Miss Mahan up by accident earlier when I was trying to have one of the people from ATED uh, go, go back to the attendees list. But uh, so I, I will be very brief. Um, as has been practice, I wanted to provide the board with an update on what we are contemplating uh, in terms of searching for a new department head. Uh, I think as the board knows, uh, David Good has recently retired as the town's chief technology officer. Uh, David gave well over a decade of really tremendous service to the town uh, and will be sorely missed. Uh, he, he's not entirely going away. He's willing to come back in a limited capacity to help us through the transition period, but yet leaves very big shoes to fill. Uh, so we did a little bit of research before putting this before you and learned that uh, today's standards suggest that the job we are actually looking to fill and the job David was doing would be better titled chief information officer uh, as opposed to chief technology officer. So that's why you see see it titled as such. So what we've laid out for you in the memo is a process that you can see um, tries to cast a wide net, uh, both from uh, a technology expertise point of view, as well as a diversity point of view in terms of attracting candidates. Uh, and then we go through a multi-step process that is inclusive of uh, IT experts within the community that we often rely on. You see members of ITAC being solicited to be part of this recruitment and screening process. Uh, because this is a position that is shared with the schools, much like facilities, uh, the school administration will be very, uh, very much included in this process. Uh, so we hope to go through um, both a recruitment where we're soliciting applicants, a screening process, a multi-stage interview and panel process, and hopefully have a selected candidate sometime by the end of April. Overall, we would like to have someone likely able to start just around the end of the school year. Uh, we, we more than likely wanna keep the existing interim structure in place through the school year due to the importance of, um, IT is always important to the schools, but given the remote learning uh, that's happening, we wanna keep what we have in place through the end of the school year and then hopefully be able to recruit a candidate to have them start uh, just as the transition to the summer is beginning. So we are looking to post this uh, very soon. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. But again, I wanted to make sure the board was aware of what our thoughts were about recruiting for this very important position. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move receipt of the memorandum and thank uh, the town manager for the uh, for the outline there. Uh, um, and I, I have no questions. Mrs. Mahan. I'll second that and similar to Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, the town manager's explanation as well as memo pretty much covers it. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yeah, you know, I'm fine. I mean, end of April seems a little aggressive. I mean, so if it takes more time to get quality candidate, I'll understand. 
I, and I'll say, I, I appreciate that. I, I think we often in recruitment will put an aggressive timeline to, tr to give ourselves sort of a push goal to get to. It often can take longer depending on who applies or even sometimes just scheduling of the panel interviews when you really get into the nitty gritty of it. But uh, I think historically we've tried to set set goals that we know might be a little aggressive, but just to try to keep us on pace to make sure we get um, get the key personnel that we need. Great, thanks. All right, and so we have a motion to receive by Mr. DeCourcy, second by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item number 10 on our agenda, discussion and vote, town manager's contract renewal. And I want to thank Mrs. DeCourcy for noting this from Tom Mann's contract to me. Um, and Attorney Heim, I'll rely heavily on your expertise to jump in if I am getting anything incorrectly. But the town manager's contract, as I understand it, sets a date of February 11th by which we would have to note, notify the town manager of our intent to not renew his contract or else certain provisions would kick in. Um, so we just wanted to put this on to make sure we had a discussion about that prior to that date passing. And then the discussions to start the process of renegotiating any a contract if it if the time is so to do so. Attorney Hyman, any uh, additions to that? Yeah, if I may, Mr. Hurd, I just I just wanna uh, clarify for folks that the, 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 the real uh, crux of what's going on here is that the manager's contract has a built-in sort of uh, non-renewal notice time frame. And that's what's right in front of you in terms of the sort of immediacy of it. If you intend not to renew the town manager, um, you, know, you have to give notice or uh, the manager is entitled to uh, a certain amount of severance uh, under his contract. Um, if you do intend to renew the manager, you can say we intend to renew the manager tonight and um, that you know we'll set forth a schedule for um, you know, uh, discussion of evaluations and contracts and all that kind of stuff uh, over the course of, you know, uh, the next year. Yep. Thank you. Are there any motions to not renew the manager? All right, any discussion of the board? Uh, Mr. Corsi? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, I, I viewed this as the, the, we are entering the last year of the town manager's contract um, late, well, it's later this week on, on February 11th, and I think it is an appropriate time for us to um, start thinking about discussing renewal, uh, or at least laying out a schedule to discuss renewal with the manager. And um, you know, we, we talked about this previously, and I think we also are behind as a board on the, the evaluation process. So we, we and I'm as guilty as, as uh, maybe a, a, other members that uh, we, we should be doing that as well. So I, I raised this because I knew the one year period was was coming up and, and I think we should um, we should be moving forward with, with those discussions at, at, at some point, um, probably before the end of the fiscal year. Sure. All right. It is a good time for to reiterate. I also am deficient in my on the town manager's evaluations, which I'm supposed to be overseeing. Those will go directly to Ms. Cove, uh, Ms. Karen Cove. I think it's reasonable at this point to maybe prioritize that and say, would the board be able to get those into her by the next seven days, 14 days? I know Mr. Dickens is, our, is the one member who has been on top of it, but um, I would say to Mr. DeCourcy and Mrs. Mahan, if that's a feasible time frame. That's feasible for me. Um, I just would put it out, should it be 14 days? Um, taking into account that um, Mr. Carroll will be officially resigning this Friday. So it will give the person that is appointed um, to fill out the remaining three or four meetings. If we say seven days, that person may technically only get one or two days to complete that versus 14 days gives them in 14 actual days, not 14 business days. So I put that out. And then um, am I correct that we don't have to 
do anything tonight. Like we don't have to take a motion to say that the board is not, um, uh, not inciting, not voting for section 13 of the town manager contract by virtue of us doing nothing that leads, meets the legal right. um, bar that the town manager needs. Correct. Yep. Okay. So we just wanted to put, put it out there for discussion just to make sure that the date didn't pass without okay. us acknowledging that. Yeah. So if we could do 14 days, is that okay, Mr. Chair? Yep. My colleagues? Yep. Well, it's up to you all. I mean, whatever. I mean, you can decide how much time you want. You know, so, so. Yeah, I'm just trying to get, I mean, certainly things come up and we, we all know that with the current world happenings, but it, I want to try to, at least for Ms. Cove's sake, get that into her so she doesn't have to keep reminding me that the evaluations are still pending. Yeah, yeah. And, and there is one a facet of um, the contract which has nothing to do with um, sort of an outside um, allowance that I've had conversations with the town manager and he's indicated that would be the proper forum so um, once the evaluation, pro all the evaluations are in, um, then we can, um, I can have those conversations legally, um, not so much with the town manager, but with my colleagues. I can't do it unless um, we're in those negotiations. And it's nothing untoward or a critique or criticism or anything like that. Um, but I, I have spoken with the manager about it um, in the past. So it, I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to, you know, slip something in. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Attorney Heim, so no motions are necessary on this particular item tonight, right? There's nothing necessary. I mean, the board yeah. can the board can make a whatever statement it, it wants um, in terms of a motion. But the, the only thing that would be necessary is you would have to move to say, we're not renewing the manager if you wanted to afford yourself that under the contract. You could, you know, I mean, obviously by your discussion, uh, it's, it seems pretty clear that you intend to pursue renewal. So you could make that motion as well, that we intend to pursue renewal and we'll seek that out uh, uh, following our evaluation period. Mrs. If you wanted a cage in a positive, uh, uh, I like. Mr. Corson, would you like to make that motion? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that makes good sense. Thank you, Attorney Heim. And, and so I, I would move that. And I, and I think it's important as, as we enter the last year, we we value the manager's services and we we want to continue that relationship. And, and um, so I, uh, you said it so well, Attorney Heim. I don't have the exact words, but yeah, I, I would want to move that we intend to to renew the manager and, and have discussions with him following the evaluations. Thank you, Mr. Mon. I would definitely second that. I was kind of fishing to see if that's what I should, should be doing oh, because sorry. I wanted to. No, that's no, no, it's not, not for you. That's our, That's what I was asking you, Attorney Hein, but that's okay. I'm sorry. I'll evaluate you on your advice you just gave me, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> and I'm sorry, saying that in jest, that I want to send a very clear mes message as, um, so I will second Mr. DeCourcy's motion, very clear message uh, in terms of similar to what we heard on the agenda here tonight. Mr. Chapdelaine is a vital asset um, employee manager that the town of Arlington needs to retain um uh not just in light of covid but that on top of it so i I'm, I'm glad that we are you know i didn't want to just do nothing so that means we're not doing anything and have any, anyone um interpret that as uh any sort of anything besides the uh exemplary town manager that we have and that we need and, and we need to retain so thank you mr chair so chapter is vital to the town just like rcn that's what we learned tonight all right, Mr. Dickens, anything additional? Hires great staff too. Yep. All right, so we have a motion by Mrs. DeCourcy, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you, Attorney Heim. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. <clears throat> I am number 11 on our agenda, discussion and approval, second supplemental comment letter to ZBA re Thorndike place for to be application attorney Han. thank you mr chair um i'll be brief um i hope you folks have gotten an opportunity to review this um i, I had an opportunity to work a little bit with mr hurd and mr de Corsi in trying to incorporate some of the discussions that we've had some of the comments that individual members have made concerns expressed 
the correspondence from the land trust, just to reiterate the what I understand to be the board's position that, you know, yes, there have been some incremental uh, changes uh, proposed by the applicant, but it really doesn't change the picture from the board's perspective on why this project doesn't make sense uh, for Arlington. So um, I'm happy to receive any feedback um, and uh, make any changes, uh, tweaks. I know that, I apologize, Mr. DeCourcy, you had mentioned a few to me that I, I, I fear that I may have missed in one of the iterations of this. Uh, any other things that you folks need, think I need to uh, update in this, I'm happy to do so. I've got it ready to go. Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to thank Attorney Heim. Um, he had a lot of play last week and he had um, produced this draft, um, among other things he was working on with the, the closing of the warrant. And uh, so we appreciate that to, to keep things moving here. And um, what I was going to move is that, that we move or approval of the letter subject to final edits um, that you and, and town council may have, Mr. Hurd. I, I believe it's going to come to your signature, but there's a couple of things here or there. It doesn't change the substance of the letter. And, and rather than you know, wordsmith every point, I didn't um, didn't want to bring that up. I, I do want to say two things that uh, in addition to, to what's in here, and, and I appreciate the language um, at footnote one, where we talked about how this project has changed since, or the proposed projects changed since it was first submitted. And, and so now what we have is a 176 unit building that is with frontage on Dorothy Road, the perhaps some, the least objectionable piece of the proposed project as initially proposed was the 12 townhouses. Those are gone now. And, and so we, we put in that uh, language that uh, we know this isn't an improvement, at least as to those townhouses. Um, I also want to raise the, um, the issue, it's on page two of the letter, that talks about undevelopable portions of the Mugar Woods um, in terms of what's being proposed. And at the last ZBA meeting, there was a statement by the um, developer from Oak Tree that, uh, that their, their stated desire is to um, deed the excess land beyond Thorndike Place to the town for future conservation improvements. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that that if there is any discussion about what happens with that property, that it, it, there's going to be standards that are put in place for the cleanup of that property and, and the maintenance of that property before there's, there's any approval or any discussion about it being transferred to the town for the town's cleanup uh, after the fact. So I appreciate uh, Attorney Heim mentioning that. I think there was gonna be a footnote added on that point. And um, last thing I wanna say, it just goes beyond the letter, but things are moving along before the ZBA. There was a meeting, the last meeting before the ZBA to do with the architectural design of the property. And there was a long statement that was made by the uh, representatives from Oak Tree in terms of what they're doing. And, and one thing that just struck me at that time was a, a statement that they made, that we listened to your concerns about size and spread. Well, I don't see that there has been any listening to those concerns. And I think we, we need to still, um, as we're doing now, reiterate our opposition to the size and scope of this, this project and, and send this along to the ZBA and um, I think we're doing that through this letter. So so thank you to Attorney Heim for, for producing this on short notice. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I'd like to second uh, Mr. DeCourcy's motion um, and I'm not gonna repeat what he said, which is exactly what I had written down on my piece of paper uh, in, in terms of the letter in the conservation area. Um, the only other question I have, which is perhaps not germane directly to this agenda item, is the other um, action step um, that we spoke about, which is uh, sending a, a letter um, to Peter Mugar regarding some uh, co uh, corrections to the site, cleanup of the site. Um, has that letter been sent? Is it still in um, 
being drafted to be sent. Um, uh, yeah, either Mr. Chair or the town manager, if anyone could enlighten me on that. The town manager can add to this, but the letter will go out tomorrow. The, the letter is ready to be drafted. Um, we're just waiting on the correct address to make sure it gets to, to the right location. But Mr. Chaplin can speak to that as well. Yeah, you certainly. Just to reiterate that, Mr. Hurd, uh, yeah, the le letters printed, my signature's on it. We'll get that address. We'll get Mr. Hurd's signature on it. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy took the lead in drafting it, uh, and Attorney Heim made some uh, made some edits, but yes, it's, re it's ready to go. And um, if you can give it a quick summary of what the letter is um, contains to the Mugars, Peter Mugar and or um, will the board, after that's all compiled, just see a copy of it? I'm not saying uh, it doesn't need to go out. It should go out, so. I, I can I, I can definitely forward the board the final copy at that without question, and Mr. DeCourcy or, or Attorney Hyde, please feel free to to add to anything I missed. But I, I think that the general message is we we feel as though the the family has long been negligent in their upkeep and maintenance of the site. Uh, that we have been putting a lot of town resources into working and providing services to the population that's housed on the site, um, and that we would like to engage the Mugars with, uh, in a conversation about playing the role they should be playing in the upkeep and maintenance of the site and potentially even providing services to those residing on the site. And to begin such a conversation, we're asking them for a site visit uh, within the next several weeks to begin uh, for them to both witness firsthand um, the state of the site, uh, as well as starting a conversation about what role they can play. That sounds great, thank you. So I don't wanna slow up the process. It's going out tomorrow. The rest of the board, when it's finalized, we'll see a copy of it. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think it's a well-crafted letter. I mean, I think it's very respectful. I can I, mean, I can easily put myself in the place of someone on a board like ZBA receiving a letter like this from a board such as Elect Board and feeling respected. I mean, so it's done. Um, it's, it's good in that respect. Um, I'm not going to wordsmith, but I will just say the last sentence of the fourth paragraph I find confusing. You know, uh, so so if that's not one of your um, things to check, I mean, I'll just flag that as something to check. I didn't quite understand it. I, I mean, I kind of get where it's going, but then when I try reading it, I'm, I get a little lost at the end. So that's it. Thank you. Mr. Diggins, I'm sorry. Can you just tell me which page and paragraph that is again? Um, it's the last sentence of the fourth paragraph. Let me just double check that. Uh, significantly, we recall that applicants had previously claimed. Okay. Got it. Is that it, Mr. Higgins? Um, I I'm gonna have to pull it back up. Sorry, I accidentally closed it. You know. Oops. Almost there. So it's first, second, third. Yes, the fourth paragraph. I mean, yeah, significantly we recall that the applicants have previously claimed. Um, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's in the third paragraph. I'm sorry, I was a little confused because of the footnote. I mean, so the sentence starts at this juncture, common sense informs this board, and then it ends with some um, concerns for your deliberations. So that sure. one I just found confusing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I'll work on that. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thanks. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you. I, I, the two things I, I didn't mention earlier, and I, and I think you know, we had talked about this last time. We want to continue to respect the ZBA's role here. They're the ones that are deciding the, um, the comprehensive permit application. These are comments for their consideration, but it's before them right now, and we need to respect that process. I did want to add one other um, suggestion if we could somehow work it into the letter that we encourage the ZBA as part of their deliberations if they haven't already to, to make a site visit as, as, as part of their overall determination because I think that is helpful in terms of looking at the site and, and what's there and, and um, it, what limitations there are for uh, both environmentally traffic and otherwise. Yep. We'll do. 
Yep, and I just want to thank Mr. Corsi for his insight and Attorney Heim for his work on the letter. I think it's, you know, another, it's good for us to continue to make sure that the ZBA is supported by the select board. It's their decision, but for them to know that they have our support as they go through the process, um, looking at the updated project, it's clear that the developer just wants to rely on the benefits that they receive from the 40B statute rather than instituting the town, the feedback and the suggestions of the residents of the area and the town. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that they have our support and whatever resources necessary as they go through this process. Um, so we'll be, I will connect with attorney Heim to make the final edits, institute some of the suggestions that we've received and we'll get this out to the ZBA ASAP. All right, so we have a motion from Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right. That takes us to correspondence received, correspondence from town council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to take something off the agenda. I thought that there was going to be um, some other correspondence received. Doesn't look like it's on there. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But uh, this correspondence for me was was basically in response to um, uh, correspondence to the board about um, the town staff's support of our one, our articulation of the one and a half percent before the HAC and I. I've drafted something, uh, I've communicated to the board, but I don't want to unnecessarily take the board's time tonight if um, the other correspondence isn't on the, the isn't mm -hmm. on the agenda. Thank you. That brings us to new business. Attorney Hahn. Uh, no new business, thank you. Ms. Chaplain. Uh, one uh, brief piece of new business. I just want to express uh, a very sincere thank you to the DPW and all the staff who have worked hard over the past couple of weeks, that always working hard, but specifically over the past couple of weeks with the snow we've received. I feel like this has been a sneaky winter where we've gotten a pretty significant amount of snow and it might not seem like it because it's had a couple of melt cycles, but um, as always, uh, they've gone above and beyond. And I think in some cases yesterday, weren't able to watch the Super Bowl or miss a good portion of the Super Bowl because of the work they were doing. Uh, but they continue to do a great job and they're very deserving of our thanks and appreciation. And I wanted to express that tonight. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, I echo Mr. Chaplain on that. And um, three three things kind of short. Uh, first is um, um, I'd like to, um, Sandy Pooler actually responded to me regarding the blue bikes conversation that we had uh, in when we did the quarterly budget update. And there was a question that I had regarding, it seemed like the blue bikes were over budget, but it was just really a transposed line. Me, So he got back to me and explained that he, the blue bikes were indeed on budget. Um, the second thing, um, maybe not so short, but I'll try and keep it short. And it's, um, it's a little personal. Uh, and and um, when I ran for select board, it, I intentionally did not run on identity because I'm not really a big fan of identity politics. It, uh, uh, but uh, it is Black History Month, I mean, and and I have to say that it um it was so positive running for select board, I mean, and and um and feeling totally welcomed by this town. And that I remember just recently, I heard you know a woman, the woman who was like refereeing for uh, the Super Bowl, who said it, the goal is that it, for it not to be a big deal when a woman you know, is, is refereeing for a, a football game. And I kind of felt that that was how it was being when I was running. It just wasn't that big a deal. I mean, it was definitely noteworthy, but, but there was like no consternation. And, 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 and as I said in an article uh, uh, for um, maybe the advocate, you know, uh, it was interesting that it, I was considered me the one of the um, establishment or more establishment candidates. I mean, uh, I, mean uh, I wasn't the, the first gay guy on, on the board. You know, I mean, there was another gorgeous 
a select board member who had that honor. Uh, uh, but but uh, so so in, in history, of, uh, in light of um, Black History Month, I just wanted to kind of flag that because I mean, uh, it just means a lot to me that you know, I am part of what I consider a very warm and welcoming community. And I have to thank Mr. Curo you know, um, as one of the people uh, that in, encouraged me uh, to run you know, um, a, 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 a Shif Seuss he was the one who initially talked to me and told me that the community need, um, there was backing for the community need for me to, not backing, but encouragement need for me to run. And I remember once I sat at um, Mr. Kuro's um, seat while testing microphones for ACMI, and he took a picture of me at, at the seat. He did. So, so um, uh, I guess that started wheels turning for everybody. You know? and, and he is just such a warm and loving and wonderful person. And so I, um, I wore this tie for him. It's all hearts, you know? uh, partly for him and partly for, um, uh, for Valentine's Day and, of course, partly for um, Marika Palka. So that's it. Thanks for indulging me on this, these three. Did you tell Dan to stick around till new business so he could receive that that wonderful com compliment? No, I didn't even know he was going to be on. You know, <laughs> so, so. Right. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just two things briefly. I apologize. I'm having some speaker issues, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, but earlier in the night, we you had mentioned it, Mr. Chairman, the the site that Olivia Adams, an Arlington resident, had created and. There was a discussion whether there's a link already. That that link is indeed already on the town's website. So if you go on that, there's a link to macovidvaccines.com, and it really it, it gives people access to the uh, to the regional sites. So what's available in Springfield? What's available at Gillette? And what's available at Fenway? And I think there's a couple of others. But it's a a remarkable program. It's a user friendly program, which is really what we need. So. Um, Thank you to Olivia Adams, an Arlington resident who did that. The second thing I, I wanted to um, this bring up is, is tonight, or well, last meeting was Mr. Curro's last meeting with the, with the board. And I'm hoping that when we're back in the chamber, we can give him an appropriate um, thank you and recognition for his years of service. I just wanna thank him briefly tonight. Um, I first met Joe back in the early 2000s. I was on the Sims Advisory Committee and he was a neighbor um, who was concerned about what was going into the site. And he showed up to every meeting, got involved. And, and from there, he took that to um, working on the Sims Neighborhood Committee. He served on the school committee for four years and of course on the select board for nine years. And he gave valuable service to the town. He was a real resource for me over the years when, um, while I was on finance committee, we would chat often about school committee, school budget issues. And um, in my two years on the board, I've, I've really enjoyed working with him. And I know um, we're, we're gonna miss him as a, as a colleague. We are still gonna see him in town. Um, and um, I wanna wish Mr. Carroll all the best and to thank him um, for everything that he has done, both as a colleague and as a leader in this community. One good thing about Joe, he's a walker, so you can always see him walking up and down Mass Ave or Summer Street in Arlington. Um, yeah, I also just wanted to, again, thank Mr. Carl for his years of service to the town, uh, both as a select board member, school committee member, and beyond. Um, I've always looked to him as a resource and someone to bounce advice off of. Um, and he always gave you his honest opinion, and. Um, I, I really do appreciate that and all the work that he's done for the town. Um, we always bonded as the jumbos on the on the board in, in town politics. So we could always, it's always the jumbos against the MIT guys, but we seem to be outnumbered, but jumbo strong. All right, so the other item is just, it's been touched on, we do need to fill his seat within 30 days under the Town Manager Act. We have a meeting that's coming up. We've gone through this process, unfortunately, a number of times. In fact, we seem to be old pros at filling seats um, late in a term. And so this is our third time in the past six years. So we're gonna simplify the process. There's no specific requirement that we go through any individual process, which Attorney Hyman can correct me. So what we'll do is we'll, 
at the next meeting, we'll just take nominations and vote. Um, so if anyone is interested in serving, they can reach out to the select board office. But um, other than that, we're not gonna set any specific parameters for how we're gonna fill that seat. We'll, it, we'll put it on the agenda, we'll take nominations and we'll vote as a board. Attorney Heim, is that all square with your understanding? Sorry, I, I, I think I think Miss Lahan uh, also had a new business, uh, but oh, um, sorry, yeah. Miss Lahan. Uh, no, I'm okay. I'm waiting. I was just waiting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one of my questions was going to be about um, Mr. Caro's uh, temporary fill-in. I will say that this Sunday I did call Clarissa Brady, kind of jumping the gun, hoping that uh, we could bring her back for yet another ring. Uh, but considering that, you know, she's on the, I, I know different, different people will apply. So I'm amenable to the uh, process that the chair has outlined and, and to Mr. Diggins um, remarks, Sarah Thomas is the coach, um, a, a referee at the NFL game. And she's been at previous games. She started back in the nineties. And we also have two female coaches, not head coaches yet, but um, in the, in the NFL football is very near and dear to all of our hearts. And um, the only other thing I had under new business is um, either to the chair or through the chair um, regarding the uh, committee that was set forth by town meeting regarding the police civilian review board. I may not be saying that right, um, which uh, outlined the members as well as outlined three of them being ex officio so they can't vote uh, meaning the police chief, town council, and uh, member of the board or their designee, which I do not take in a positive light, but that's the committee, how it was voted. If you're going to put someone on a committee, they should vote. My question is, is can someone let me know? Here's what I'm, I'm wondering about. Have all the uh, committee members been appointed to that committee? So it now means that a uh, member of the select board or its designee who was chosen that we can't vote, but we have to be the admin person. Um, are we at that point? And if that's the case, uh, I don't want the select board to be accused of delaying the process that either, if we're at that point that it has to be a member of the board and I'm not volunteering for it or its designee, um, when do we have to do our part in that process? I believe we appointed Ms. Kropelka to run that, correct, at the last meeting for the sole purpose of facilitating the first meeting. Mr. Uh, Chair, may I? Yep. If I can actually, if, if it would be most efficient, I'll, I'll address uh, these couple points in a row. Uh, first and foremost, I think that it's a fair, uh, a good question by, by Ms. Mahan. I also know that there's a bunch of other folks, uh, some of the folks who were the original proponents of that article that want to sort of update. Um, I'd be happy to, I, I, I've, I've been meaning to, uh, to catch up with uh, the manager and uh, maybe uh, Ms. Roman to see if we can sort of do an inventory of where we are and who's made all their appointments so we know how close we are because there were so many different appointing authorities and there's not one centralized one. Um, and I apologize for not uh, sort of being right on top of that. So Ms. Mahan, I'm happy to um, sort of uh, take the lead on that and make sure that we know uh, where everybody is and if there are any outstanding appointments. The last time I checked, they weren't all done yet but it'd be nice uh, for me to give the board that information and some of the interested members of, of the public. And then on the, um, yes, Mr. Uh, Chair, on the um, uh, vacancy, uh, there's no real requirement under the Town Manager Act. You just have to fill it within 30 days. You guys vote with the moderator. Um, you know, uh, the process makes sense to me, um, especially given the, the short hour. While we've unfortunately had to do this a couple of times, I'm not sure we've had to do it so close to um, the election previously. So um, obviously there's not a ton of time uh, to get things together, but I'll also work um, to see whether or not it's possible to appoint somebody and have them start that evening if you guys wanna get going on warrant article hearings. So th thank, thank, you, thank you guys and I'll make sure to keep uh, folks posted if that's okay, Ms. Mahan, Ms. Hurt. No, no, that's fine. And my only thing is um, since the, the 
member of the select board or the designee also has to be the person who takes not only sets up the meeting but takes the minutes of the first meeting um whether that still will be mrs kropelka or whether that will be ms ma that's the only reason i raise that thank you mr chair okay all right with that just slightly before 10 o'clock an improvement i'll take a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn second all right, uh, motion to adjourn from Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Hines. Mrs. Mahan. Um, Mrs. Kropelk and I had a friendly non-monetary bet. I was close to winning it, but yes, Mrs. Kropelka, you won. I. I can really slow this down, but I love Maria. <laughs> no, no, she already won. I, I was, I should have been done 30 minutes ago. Oh, okay. I was going to win. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Good night, Ms. folks. Good night, folks. Good night. Take care. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.